Thank you, Representative Wood. The House will come to order. Please join Representative Bacon in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Shebel, please call the roll. Representatives Amabile. Representative Amabile is excused. Bacon, Baisley, Benavidez, Burnett, Bird, Bockenfeld, Basenecker, Bradfield, Caravale, Carver, Catlin. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Catlin's excused. Cutter, Doherty, Duran, Esgar, Exum, Froelich, Geithner, Gonzalez Gutierrez, Gray, Representative Gray's excused. Hanks, Rep. Hanks is excused. Herod, Holtorf, Hooten. Representative Hooten. Rep. Hooten is excused. Judah, Kennedy, Kip, Larson, Lindsey, Lantin, Luck. Representative Luck is excused. Lynch, McCluskey, McCormick, McKean, McLaughlin. Rep. McLaughlin is here. Michael Sinjane, Mullica. Representative Mullica is excused. Neville, Ortiz, Pelton, Pico, Ransom, Rich, Ricks, Roberts, Sandridge, Sirota, Snyder, Soper, Sullivan, Tipper, Titone, Valdez A. Representative Valdez A is excused. Valdez D. Van Beber, Van Winkle, Weissman, Will, Williams, Woodrow, Woog, Young, and Mr. Speaker. With 60 present, five excused, we have a quorum. Representative Bacon. Representative Bacon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to point out a hello to all the children here in the chambers because I moved at the Journal of Friday. <laughs> April 22nd, 22, be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Thank you, Representative Bacon. Members, that is a proper motion. The motion before us is the adoption of the journal as corrected by the chief clerk. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. 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 I'm looking up to the gallery. I think all the kids agree with me. The ayes have it, and the motion's approved. Announcements and introductions. Representative Cutter. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so it's great to be here today to welcome the Green Team superheroes in the uh, gallery. Yay! Uh, I, I think representing three schools today in my district, House District 25 in uh, beautiful Jefferson County. And they um, are amazing, focused, dedicated young leaders on making a better environment and supporting the planet and doing all the great things. They recycle, they uh, look at energy conservation use, and they're just phenomenal. And I'm so happy to see them in their green capes up there. Welcome, green team. Representative Bird. Members, if it's Monday, it's finance. And I just realized I only get to say that a few more times this session, but we will really be having a lot of fun in finance today. We have eight bills scheduled. So beginning promptly at 1.30, we will kick things off with, um, let's see, HCR 1006, House Bill 1029, House Bill 1123, House Bill 1346, House Bill 1357, House Bill 1345, House Bill 1391, and rounding things off with House Bill 1392. I look forward to seeing you there. Any further announcements or introductions? Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, for members of state civic, military, and veterans affairs, and others who are concerned about the policies we look at, we have a meeting today at 1.30 p.m. in LSBA to hear House Bill 1393, Senate Bill 133, Senate Bill 162, Senate Bill 174, House Bill 1327, and Senate Bill 150. Also, later in the week, we normally have Thursdays upon adjournment, but because we are not going to be having the upon adjournment committees later in the week, please do plan on a Wednesday afternoon committee meeting for state affairs. This will uh, potentially be at the same time as other committees that we're not normally overlapping with, so there may need to be a little bit of uh, shuffling of committee members to make sure everyone can be at their committee on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kennedy. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Agriculture, Livestock, and Water Committee will be meeting for the last time today in this session at 1.30. Um, downstairs, we will be hearing from the Forest Service on their annual report to us and hearing one Senate bill. So we'll see you at 1.30. Representative Van Pepper. Yes, it's that time of year again. I have a tribute uh, to recognize the Colorado Auctioneers Association. Hold on, members. We have a tribute. Please direct your attention to the well, Mr. Schiebel. State of Colorado. The House of Representatives convened in the 73rd General Assembly hereby extends sincere commendations to the Colorado Auctioneers Association. The Colorado Auctioneers Association exists to promote public auctions and the auction method of marketing through professional and ethical auctioneering practices in the state of Colorado. Membership is open to auctioneers, auction companies, and associates with an interest in this age-old method of marketing. The members of the House of Representatives recognize and thank the Colorado Auctioneers Association for promoting the highest standards of professionalism in the competitive free enterprise system. On request of Representative Tanya Van Beber, given this 25th day of April 2022, State Capitol, Denver. Representative Van Beber. Thank you. Today we have the Colorado Auctioneers Association with us in attendance led by President Dean Gunther, who is joined by members of the association, including the state champion auctioneer and ringman Tony Wisely, and the youth state champion Aaron Rodriguez, a 15-year-old from Hudson who is a freshman at Weld County High School. Colorado Auctioneers Association exists to educate auction professionals, to promote CAA members, and to monitor legislation in Colorado for the auction industry. I am honored to host the Colorado Auctioneers Association today as we recognize this unique industry. Today's auction of both the United States and Colorado flags, which have been flown over the Capitol, will be presided over by state champion auctioneer and ringman, Tony Wisely. The proceeds of this auction will go to a charity of choice. This is one of the best moments of the session. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Van Beber. Welcome to the House Chamber. Representative D. Valdez is gonna hand you the mic and we're gonna get started. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome members. Here we go. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Such an honor to be here with you this evening, representing the Colorado Auctioneers Association. Now, I was told that the proceeds go to the 
intern program, but if it's a different place, I understand that, but hopefully we can raise as much money as possible right here for the intern program. We're going to offer you first. It would be nice if the taxpayers paid us more, but it's all right. No worries. <laughs> okay, I have this just in. The, the, am I, if I get the name correct, I believe we're going to donate the flags to the family of Kimmy Lewis is here. Is that correct? Oh, I like that. So it's an honor to do that, and then proceeds will go to benefit that program. So with that in mind, and I'll point out, our, uh, our junior champion is right here going to display the flag, and we have members of the association around the edge who will take bids. You can turn your bid into me or to them. Let's do good. Raise money for that program. Tell me. How many dollars on it? Who give a thousand? Perry, but to get the... Oh, a thousand already. Now eleven. I'll bet a thousand to get eleven. Eleven hundred twelve. I'll bet eleven to get to twelve. I'll get twelve hundred. I'll bet get twelve. I'll bet get twelve hundred. I'm at eleven there. I'll get twelve. I'm eleven with you. I'll bet get twelve. I'll bet get twelve. Twelve. I'll get twelve hundred. I'll eleven twelve. Twelve hundred. Thank you. Thirteen prior. I'll get thirteen. I twelve. I'll get thirteen. Three. I'll get thirteen. I twelve. I'll get thirteen. 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 How about twelve fifty? One time. I'll get twelve. Twelve. Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half. I'll get thirteen. Twelve and a half. Thirteen in the back. Now half. I do thirteen. I'll get half. Where? I'll get half. Half. I'll get thirteen fifty. All in. All done. Goes to a great cause. Thirteen at fourteen hundred. Where? Ah, thirteen. I'll get fourteen. 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 Fourteen hundred. Thank you, ma'am. Fourteen fifty. I do fourteen. I'll get half. Where? I'll get half. I'll get half. And I have fourteen. I'm going to get 1450, 1450, 1450, sold right here, $1,400. No, no, no. Now, you were standing in front of another name tag, ma'am, or... Representative Hooten. Representative Hooten, come on down. Representative Hooten. I wanted to get the name right. Hooten, which is different than the name of the deals that you were in front of, so I want to get that right. Thank you so much for your bidding and enthusiasm, and you'll get to present that Colorado state flag that has been flown over the capital here. Next up, we have the American flag for that patriotic person. We're actually going to give it to that family right there. Tell me, I'm going to let everybody in. Who get 500? Where? Everybody get 500. 500, everybody get 6. 600, 7. 7, he, where? Everybody get 8. He, everybody get 800. 9, he, everybody get 900. I don't know, he, everybody get 9. He, everybody get 9. Where? Everybody get 9. 900, everybody get $1,000. I don't know, he, everybody get 1,000. How about get 1,000? Where? Everybody get 1,000. How about get 1,000? He, the one of one, everybody get 1,000. 900, everybody get 1,000. All in. 1,000, everybody get 1,100. I'll bet 1,000, everybody get 11. 1,000, everybody get 11. Where? 1,000, 11, 12, 12, 12, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, he, the one of 1,300. 14, 14, you're out of here, you're gonna get 14. Ah, 1300, you're gonna get 14, 10, you're gonna get 14, and I have 13, you're gonna get 14, 13, you're gonna get 14, you're gonna get 14, you're gonna get 1400, 13, 14, 15, where? I have 14, you're gonna get 15, 14, here, you're gonna get 1500, all in, all done. 14, you're gonna get 15, and I have 14, you're gonna get 1500. Now's the time, 14, you're gonna get 15, and I have 14, you're gonna get 15, 14, you're gonna get 15, and I have 14, you're gonna get 15, 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 14, you're gonna Representative Caitlin, is that correct? Caitlin, thank you so much, sir. What an honor to sell that to you. Once again, I'd like to thank the generosity of the House Chamber for both the Kimmy Lewis family and for the intern program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Van Beber. Okay. The next order of business, our first order of business, is consideration of memorials. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Memorial 1002. House Memorial 1002 by Representatives Neville and Luck, memorializing Representative Kimmy J. Lewis. Representative Neville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Memorial 1002 and ask for it to be read at length. It has been properly moved to Mr. Schiebel. Whereas our respected colleague, Kimmy J. Lewis, a member of the Colorado General Assembly, departed this life on December 6, 2019. And whereas Representative Lewis was born on March 19, 1957 in La Junta, Colorado, to Kenneth and Jewel Clark. 
And whereas Representative Lewis was raised on her family's cattle ranch halfway between Kim and La Junta, Colorado, where she and her three older sisters worked as ranch hands. And whereas while attending Kim High School, Representative Lewis started her first cow herd, was the most valuable basketball player in the women's single A division, and was the Colorado Hereford queen. And whereas Representative Lewis attended Trinidad State Junior College on a basketball scholarship where she majored in music. And whereas in 1975, Representative Lewis married George David, or Dave Lewis, her high school sweetheart. And in 1977, after her graduation from college, they moved to Branson, Colorado, and had six children. And whereas in 1992, Representative Lewis and her husband purchased her family's ranch and operated it along with a cattle and feed hauling business. And whereas after her husband Dave's death in 2000, Representative Lewis ran both businesses and raised her children, sending all six of them to college on academic and athletic scholarships. And whereas Representative Lewis was an active member of the Las Animas Republican Party and for 30 years served as the president of the Trinidad and Las Animas County Republican Women's Club, and for many years served as the chair of Senate District 2. And whereas in 2016, Representative Lewis ran for and was elected to the State House of Representatives, where she served as the representative for House District 64 and was reelected to a second term in 2018. And whereas while serving as a state representative, Representative Lewis served on several committees, including agriculture, livestock, and natural resources, public health care and human services, transportation and energy, rural affairs and agriculture, and transportation and local government, and sponsored bills on beef, country of origin, and private property rights issues. And whereas Representative Lewis battled breast cancer three times, in 2014, during the 2018 legislative session, and finally throughout 2019. And whereas Representative Lewis is survived by her six children and 14 grandchildren. And whereas Representative Lewis was a devoted public servant who will be remembered for her hard work, dedication, and accomplishments. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives of the 73rd General Assembly of the State of Colorado, that in the death of Kimmy J. Lewis, the people of the state of Colorado have lost a dedicated public servant and an outstanding citizen, and that we, the members of the Colorado House of Representatives, do hereby extend our deep and heartfelt sympathy to the members of her family and pay tribute to a woman who served her state well and faithfully. Representative Neville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, please be seated. When you met Kimmy Lewis, you know, I think the first thing that comes to mind is courage and tenacity. I think that was the, the first thing that she protruded. There was nothing that could scare her or deter her. Um, I'll never forget when the cancer returned and, and she called me to tell me and said that there might be a chance that I might miss a couple of committees and this is the reason why. But then she was very adamant. She said, but don't you go telling anybody because I don't want anybody's pity. And, and that was the type of, of lady she was. But for those of you who didn't get a chance to know Kimmy better, there were multiple layers of her. And I think that was the first layer that you kind of saw when you first just got to know her briefly. But under that layer, there was several more. The, the loving and caring Kimmy Lewis. The, the way that she could teach a suburban boy like me the importance of country of origin labeling. And private property rights, not only teach me the importance, but pass, pass the passion on to me for her lifestyle. And then just even getting to know her more and learning her wild music skills. She wasn't, yes, she was the lady that could saddle up and go out on the ranch too, but she could also sit down and, and do some wonderful music and just truly, truly cared. But she did it in a way that that, that courage and tenacity was... I think very, very contagious to us all. And I know a lot of people ask me, only having days left in, as a legislator, are, are you going to miss it? And I often say no, but when I think about this, this is what I will miss. I will miss getting to meet people like Kimmy Lewis. I'm sad I didn't have more time with her, but incredibly, incredibly blessed to know her and to have gotten to know her family better. She was a tremendous lady, and I'm glad that we're able to get this Memorial done, and we can have the wonderful family on the floor. Thank you, Representative Neville. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was 2017 when I first learned of Representative Kimmy Lewis. I was in a meeting with a legislator who was currently serving with her, 
and he had nothing but praise. He explained to me that she set the standard for a rural legislator, for an advocate for her people. She was passionate, tenacious. He spoke so highly of her and for so long that I took interest. And from that point on, I continued to follow her career. I continued to read articles about her. I continued to watch what she was doing up here. And though I never met Representative Lewis, when I found out that she passed away, I grieved. I even shared the information, the knowledge with my parents, said Colorado lost a dear one today. When I started to run in 2020, my first visit to Otero County, it was made clear that the benchmark was Representative Lewis. That if I wanted to be a successful legislator, I needed to learn about what she did and how she did it. And that I better not take no gruff from nobody, because she wouldn't. I learned how when she was very passionate about one particular issue, she actually brought in uh, Representative Gray and sat down and work through some problems because she really wanted it to pass. She wasn't afraid of anything. I learned of a time in southeastern Colorado where there was a matter before board, and she came in ready to fight. It didn't matter who stood in her way. If there was a principal that needed defending, she was going to be there. When I was running for the general election, well, actually a little bit before that, but in the general election, I had the privilege of getting to know one of her daughters, who is now a very dear friend of mine. Her kindness, her charity, her love of ranching and of family tells me even more about Representative Lewis. She raised children to embody those same principles that she held dear. I think that is the most important legacy she will leave, is in her family, in her children, and in her grandchildren. I am disappointed that I never got to meet Representative Lewis, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to stand before you today and to take time to remember her and to remember the changes that she has brought to Colorado, not just through this building, but through her ranch, through the, the many community groups that she worked with, through her willingness to stand and hold the line. She was a woman of godly character, full of honor, full of conviction, a fierce warrior for the things that she believed were true and good and right. And I agree with all of those who have said to me, she is the benchmark. May we all seek to live up to her. I did want to read this poem. It was written by a friend of her, Marvin Hasser. Kimmy, we know you were the apple of your children's eye. We all agree and know the reason why. Perhaps you were called to head up a committee or council way up there, or to lead all the state house folks and politicians in prayer. Kimmy, there is one thing all of us down here want you to understand. We love you, Kimmy, and thank you, Kimmy, for what you've done for us all across the land. Kimmy, you always chose the high road, where the bells of freedom ring. You loved your country, America the Beautiful is the song your soul did sing. Kimmy, your concern for our welfare and freedom has always been. Kimmy, within our heart, your cherished memory will always surface again, again, and again. Kimmy, you were never one for fame or wealth. Even when you were hurting, you put your country before yourself. Kimmy, we are so very thankful for the things for our country that you have done. Your sterling memory will live on and on with us, way beyond your setting sun. Thank you, Representative Luck. We'll hear from current members, and then we will break into recess to hear from former members. Representative Hooten. And Representative McLaughlin. Representative Hooten. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome, uh, Lewis family, to the Capitol. Uh, we have seen you here before, and it's great to have you back. Um, and thank you to Representatives Luck and Neville for that beautiful tribute. It's really great to see uh, former colleagues here on the floor. Um, Representative McLaughlin and I were uh, the class of 2016 with Representative Lewis, and uh, we were also, the three of us, the same age. <laughs> and so we had uh, a lot of things in common, but we did do a uh, bipartisan uh, get-together. We had one off campus, and uh, Representative McKean was there, and there were a number of us that were there. It was really fun um, in a very non-political way for us to get to know each other. And uh, Representative McLaughlin and, and I really enjoyed our time um, at that retreat getting to know um, a colleague who would then become a very good friend. And um, there was, uh, in the fall of 2017, she had invited us down to La Junta, Otero County, to visit Muddy Valley Ranch, which we did with great enthusiasm and had a wonderful weekend. Uh, it happened to be the Mennonite Fall Festival. So we went to the Fall Festival, had a great time there. And it also happened to be uh, that time of year when the tarantulas migrated. And so as we were driving along country roads, <laughs> we had to stop um, the biggest pickup truck I've ever been in, um, the side of the road, to get out and kneel by tarantulas and get an education on actually how very benign they are. And uh, we learned a lot about uh, why they were crossing with such focus <laughs> and, um, and what the fate of the males would be at the very end. And wow, that was quite an education, wasn't it, Barb? Whoa. And plus, just seeing these enormous tarantulas. Woo. I still get goosebumps thinking about that. Um, I, I will just add one more thing. Um, I knew a lot about Kimmy, and you know, she did struggle with cancer. Uh, she had a real hard time, as her family, of course, knows, with chemotherapy, with the drugs she had to take. And she did seek alternatives, and she had a medical practitioner in Boulder uh, who she came to see regularly. So I got multiple opportunities to spend time with Kimmy um, outside of the dome. Um, I would say, without question, a woman who starts her own um, uh, not cattle ranch, but a uh, herd of cattle. Yeah. Both. Everything. Okay, she, she did, did both. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and um, was a basketball star in high school. Gets a full scholarship to college. A basketball scholarship, and gets a degree in music education. And if you've ever heard her play the piano, you would be blown away that she wasn't raised in a conservatory. She was a spectacular musician. So if you can describe Kimmy Lewis in three words or less, I would say cowgirl renaissance woman. And that is how I would describe her. Thank you. Thanks once again for the tribute, and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you, Representative Putin. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I welcome family and welcome um, current friends, I will just say. We can't, be, can't go that far away from it. Um, we did get to go and visit her on her ranch, and it was just the two of us with her. And um, if you want to win a popularity contest, go with Kimmy Lewis anywhere down there. Everybody loved Kimmy, like, oh, talk to us, be with us. And um, she was a fabulous representative. She listened to her people and represented them so well. And um, she was really just an amazing, amazing person. Um, I did not like the tarantula running up my leg, but she thought that was quite hysterical. Um, 
at the time it was uh, it was a little scarier than it should have been probably but um, we really had a good time getting to know her, getting to know her community, getting to know her ranch, meeting her family. We sat in on some town halls that she had, and um, it was our blessing to get to know Kimmy in that way and uh, remain friends with her throughout. And um, I feel very blessed that um, Kimmy was in my life because she taught me a lot um, just about being a fierce woman and about... Um, just being good. She was just a really good person to everyone. And um, I'm very honored to have known Kimmy Lewis. Thank you, Representative McLaughlin. Representative Bockenfeld and Pelton, how will we go two at a time? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to tell a little short story about Kimmy. Uh, I was elected in 2018 took office in 2019. After the election, I talked to a couple of my ranchers out in Eastern Adams and Arapahoe County. And I told them, I said, I need to hear from you folks about ranching and agriculture uh, when I'm down here at the Capitol. And they told me, they said, just stick close to Kimmy Lewis. And I said, okay. So I come down to the Capitol, they swear me in, and I'm down on the ground floor there, and this lady walks up and sticks her hand out, and she says, I'm Kimmy Lewis. And I shake her hand, and I said, I know who you are. I said, my ranchers told me that I'm supposed to stick close to you. And she smiled and chuckled and walked off. Didn't realize how I kind of plumbed the water, because whenever Kimmy would have a bill that come up, she used to come up to my desk, and she'd lean over, and she'd say, Remember what your ranchers and farmers told you. <laughs> so that's my story. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Welcome, family. What a great time to remember an awesome, awesome lady. I met her first at the 2018 Republican Assembly. I was walking up the stairs to go to concession stand, and she was sitting right next to Al, and she said, uh, Commissioner Pelton, I'm Kimmy Lewis. I said, well, it's good to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. Representative Neville had me sit right beside her here on the floor my first year. One phrase that still echoes with me to this day, Kimmy says, Pelton, keep your powder dry. <laughs> You're going to need it sometime for a big fight here. She didn't tell me to bring more powder because <laughs> there's been plenty of fights, but uh, that phrase has stuck with me, and it always will. It's very sound advice. So thank you for sharing, Kimmy, with us. What an awesome lady. Thank you, Representative Pelton. Thank you, Representative Bockenfeld. Representative Kipp and Representative Tipper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, family, for being here. Um, I know it's been a difficult couple of years, and in many ways, I think we've been waiting for a couple of years to celebrate uh, Kimmy. Uh, my name is Carrie Tiburn. I came down to the ranch and met some of you, um, if you remember, and I just wanted to share my thoughts about Kimmy because, um, you know, so much of what people have said, it's really hard to capture that kind of person uh, with, with words, right? And I remember feeling when she, when we heard that she had died, that she was like a character out of a novel, the kind that I read when I was little, looking for examples of strong women that could sort of do it all, and not in the you know, lean-in kind of way, but could get on a, a horse, and could play the piano, and could raise a family, and could be just tough as nails. And that's what Kimmy was. She was um, gritty, and I remember she'd come down to the well, and she would use her powder on something, and would start fighting, and I thought, Man, I could not disagree more with her, but I want to agree with her. I want to be on her side, right? And I just remember, it's like, it's not that she bent the will, but she just, she'd convince you because of her tenacity and sort of the purity of her arguments where her heart was coming from. And so that's when I went down and I talked to her a little bit, and this is about conservation easement, so you can imagine the fury that she brought to the floor, right? Yes. Um, but you know what, I learned a lot from her because of that, and then when I came out to the ranch, she stuck me in a truck um, with some of the folks affected by that, and I got to hear about it for about five hours that day, <laughs> and I was a convert. She had a skill about her with respect to people. Um, 
when sort of her war warmth, I think, shone on you, like nothing felt better. And I felt that as someone that didn't know her that well, but what I can say too is, um, I remember feeling that warmth down at the ranch when um, she kind of rubbed my back and said, honey, drive safely. And I thought, I can't believe Kimmy called me honey. That feels so good. Um, but the depth and the many layers, as someone said to her, um, were just an inspiration. I can't imagine what it was like to have her as a mother. You all are so luckier to have her as a grandmother. And I know she's not here with us physically, but she is a huge presence in this building, in our hearts, in our minds, and know that she's not forgotten. She's with us. Um, and we are so proud. And I just want to say, too, of all her accomplishments, you have to know that her biggest accomplishment was you, her family. Um, and uh, we are so grateful that you shared her with us. Not that you guys had a choice. I imagine she was going to do what she's going to do. But thank you for um, sharing us with her. We are all better for it. The state of Colorado is better for it. Representative, thank you, Representative Tipper. Representative Kip. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And so um, Representative Tipper and I, our first year in this chamber was um, Kimmy Lewis's last year, unfortunately. But um, so my first experience really meeting her was there was a bill coming up in energy environment, which I was serving on in the time. And um, so I, I called her up and I said, um, can I come talk to you about this bill? Because I have some questions. And, you know, it, it had to do with her land, which she was obviously very passionate about. And so I, I went and met her and she was just so polite and so respectful. She offered me a cup of tea and I was just, just like the nicest, nicest lady. And, you know, the bill came to committee and it was... Um, interesting because I thought we all went into committee thinking that bill wasn't going to make it through committee and honestly by the end of committee that bill made it through committee um, and I think it made through the session and got signed into law that year she um, did a really good job with that but um, you know then um, she was inviting us to go to her ranch um, in 2019 and take a tour of her district and I'm like oh my gosh there's so much to do okay so but I'm just so incredibly grateful um, that I made the time um, her family in particular was just the most welcoming group of people. But I mean, you know, you can see why Kimmy loved her ranch. We we spent, you know, the evening there, spent the night at the ranch, and she was just such um, a warm, welcoming hostess. But her family, you know, her legacy lives on with you because you all just live, you live Kimmy Lewis, I'm just saying. You just did such um, an amazing job of, um, bringing us into your community and telling us why everything was so important to you. So thank you for having us and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Representative Kip. Representative Williams and Van Winkle. Representative Van Winkle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, it's so fantastic to see Kimmy's family here today and so many honored guests that have served the people of Colorado so well for so many years. It's fantastic to, to have you all here. For those of you that didn't serve with Kimmy, she uh, in many ways was like a lion. She was a moral force and a strong rock in our caucus. And I think one could argue that she in fact still is that within our caucus. Kimmy Lewis, she was slow to anger, but also not to be trifled with. Um, in fact, <laughs> I almost felt sorry for any fool that would cross her or her district, or the state of Colorado. Um, she, she was so courageous and tenacious, as it's been said today, and her love for rural Colorado truly was contagious and is contagious uh, today. I, I'm so thankful that she is with Jesus today, uh, but I will miss Kimmy. Uh, I will always, no matter where I am in life, in government or outside or, or running for office or not, uh, just try to live up to the courage and wisdom and firmness for the right that she, that Kimmy did. Representative, thank you, Representative Van Winkle. Representative Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for everyone that's uh, come to help us celebrate Kimmy, Kimmy's life. Um, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm a bit emotional because um, Kimmy and I were friends, uh, fast friends, uh, even before we were elected. Um, we came in the same freshman class in 2016, and uh, we hit it off. She, she was certainly someone that I looked up to 
and um, she had a deep impact uh, on my life. So much so that I, uh, when I went to her memorial service, I, I kept the, I kept this. It's, it hangs up in my office and it's a daily reminder um, about who she is and what she stood for. And, and, you know, whenever I'm feeling down, I always like to look at, at Kimmy's favorite things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you because I think, you know, when it gets tough in this, in this building, but just tough in life, these are some good things that certainly cheer me up and I think they'd cheer you up as well. Uh, but Kimmy's favorite things, you know, number one, peace and quiet. Number two, a cool breeze on my face. Number three, rain. Number four, the smell of cedars and pines after rain or snow. Number five, the color yellow. Number six, the fall season, pumpkins, leaves, etc. Number seven, early morning sunrise. Number eight, music. Number nine, hang, hanging laundry. Number 10, clean, organized surroundings. Number 11, <laughs> genuine, down-to-earth friends that are true friends. Number 12, flowers and grass for cows. Number 13, house, horses and cows. Number 14, the feeling of being productive and accomplish, accomplishment. Number 15, good manners, Western courtesy. Number 16, cute, fuzzy kittens. That's my personal favorite. <laughs> Number 17, Bull Holland Rigs, nice ones. That's important, nice ones. Um, there's not much that I, I think I can add to this. I mean, Kimmy, Kimmy touched everyone she encountered. And if you, if you don't believe me, then ask anyone that went to her memorial service a couple of years back. That place was packed. The whole community was there. People from across Colorado were there to celebrate her life. And if you want to know how to live a good life, Remember, for those of you there, remember how many people she impacted and ask those people what, what she had meant to them. Because she meant a whole great, great deal to me and I, and I would go on to say everyone that's here to celebrate with us. So before I start crying, I'm just going to say that I want to I thank the family for sharing Kimmy with us. I'm blessed. I know a lot of us are blessed for having known her, and um, I miss her, and I know we all miss her uh, each and every day that goes by. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Williams. Representative Michael Sinjanay and Majority Leader Esker. <laughs> Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Kimmy was one of a kind. We all know there's people who serve, who come to the well every chance they get. And then there's people who sit back, observe, and when they actually get out of their seat and come to the well, the rest of us stand up and say, oh, wait a minute. That was Kimmy. So thoughtful, so genuine, that when she spoke, it was because she absolutely had something important to say. She spoke with vigor, she spoke with passion, but I'm just not talking about her speech. It's who she was. I remember sitting back, wondering if I was going to be able to connect with this woman, this conservative woman from the, from the Plains, and realizing in the first committee meeting I had with her that we had more in common than we had differences. The way she studied the bills, the way she really wanted to understand how things worked, um, the way she would nerd out. We both called that nerding out together. I was able to go and sit with her many a time and just talk things over. And although we didn't always see eye to eye, that mutual respect we had because we both wanted to dig in and do the right thing. She was a very, very passionate woman. And I respected that a whole heck of a lot. But when I started learning about her life, and the passion she had in her life, not just here, and who she was and who she, where she came from and the amazing things she's done in her life. I, my respect grew so much for her. I thought I was special. Kimmy made you feel like you were special. 
the quiet conversations that we would have off the floor, just checking in on each other. I remember every Friday, we would check in with each other to see if traffic was going to be okay for our rides home, for our drives home. She'd always tell me, make sure you're safe. You need to be back here Monday. She made you feel like you were the most important person, even if, even if you shouldn't be connected politically. She didn't care. She was one of the most genuine people I think I've ever had the privilege to serve with. She was just a phenomenal woman and greatly, greatly missed in this chamber. And I think there's two words that come to mind when I think of Kimmy Lewis. It's rural Colorado. Hate to break it to you, Representative Holtorf. <laughs> Every time she was in this well, she connected what was important, what we were discussing, back to rural Colorado in a way that made folks really pay attention and understand that divide. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm from southern Colorado, so I get it. She made sure I understood the difference between not living in Denver and rural Colorado. <laughs> I'll forever be grateful for knowing her and for serving with her. And again, and you've been thanked many a times, but to her family, thank you for sharing her not only with us, but with the people of Colorado, a phenomenal woman. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Escar. Representative Michael and Janae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, when, when the Majority Leader was speaking, I remembered um, Kimmy's, or uh, Representative Lewis's visual aids. Oh, yes. Um, uh, she always had visual aids. She would say, come on over to my cell phone. I'll show you pictures of those cows, <laughs> she, uh, the coyotes, of the whatever. She, she said, you just come on over. I got pictures on my phone. She always wanted to show pictures on the phone. Sometimes she told me, you know, that we were cancer buddies. Um, I was really upset about it because you don't want to ever be anybody's cancer buddy, right? I didn't want her to have cancer. And um, she would just check on me uh, sporadically. How, how you doing? How, you know, she knew I had a doctor's appointment. How did your visit go? She knew I had an ultrasound. How did the ultrasound go? She, like, she kept track of my cancer. And I tried to keep track of hers. But she was the most humble, um, and maybe you didn't see it, but from, from my perspective, she was the most humble person that ever graced these halls. We didn't know all of the, the amazingness of Kimmy Lewis. We just did not. And um, through, through my connection with her, through cancer, she really made me feel not alone. And I, I didn't know how much I needed that. And I hope that I gave her some comfort in knowing that she was not alone. But again, I say thank you. Thank you for sharing her with us. I wish she was here today, um, although I'm sure she's listening in, and maybe she's a little annoyed with all of us, but that's <laughs> what we got to do. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Michelson and Janae. Representative Ransom and Representative Sandridge. Representative Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I am so sorry that Kimmy died, but I am so happy that she lived. I'm so glad that she served here in the Capitol with us, and I'm so glad that I got a chance to know her. When she showed up in 28, elected in 2018, and then sworn, um, it was my it was my second term. And so I had already been here, um, and then all of a sudden this woman named Kimmy shows up, and of course I'm Kim, um, and I think I've mentioned that we had that camaraderie that I now have with Representative Duran and Representative McLaughlin, the ones that have lost a spouse. Um, when you're widowed, there's just something that you, you get this um, you get this understanding of how bad things really can be when you've lost a husband. And we both had a lot of kids. We both raised a lot of kids. And so we had a lot, we had so much in common through that aspect. But of course, I'm a city kid and she's a rural kid um, and a country 
country lady, um, but we both served on local government, so I know I had to ask her a lot of questions about conservation e easements because they work differently in my county than they do in her district. But we, we, I really learned a lot from her because of that, and I'm so glad that she took the time to explain to me what was happening out in her area of the, of the state versus how they had worked in my area of the state. Um, I was sitting in JBC, you know, we start early, and we got the news that she had just died earlier that day. And I, I was sitting there unable to talk. Apparently I'd gotten a text a little while before it was announced, and so I was sitting there just looking at my papers, trying to listen to everybody out there, and JBC realized um, that I was kind of falling apart. and. Um, I got permission to go to the funeral, even though we had uh, JBC th that day, so they actually asked me to represent JBC at the service. Um, thank you to so many people that were there. I know there were a lot of people on both sides of the aisle um, in this chamber that were there, and also from all over the state, and certainly from her area, people that had known her, but it was lovely. I mean, her service was beautiful. The church was beautiful. The area was beautiful. Driving there was gorgeous. Um, the lunch afterwards, it was fun to see people and meet people. But I just want to make sure that you all know, um, A, how much I appreciated those of you that I saw there, and B, to the family. Um, I, I remember Kimmy's strength so much. Um, that what I'll end with is I had worked I, since I had been in the legislature longer than her, I had graduated from the building across the street to the Capitol. I was so excited to get an office in the Capitol. I wasn't going to have to ice skate across Colfax um, on icy days and stuff. Well, then that year was when she was diagnosed the second time with the cancer, and she was laying down in Marilyn's office sometimes. And she remember her little suitcase, her little briefcase that she'd wheel behind her um, that had all of her papers and stuff. And it was I, I just knew that I had no business ha be having an office here in the Capitol when she was sick and going through chemo across the street. So I offered to swap with her, and she said no. She said, no, I'm, I'm here, I'm okay, I, I just want to stay. But that is how strong your mom and your grandma were, you guys, that she absolutely wanted to just stay in her own office and be normal, and she would go lay down when she needed to, but then she'd be back out here fighting, even when she was you know, wearing the wig and when she was sick from the chemo. It was just, I, I was just, proud to know her, and I will eternally be proud to know her. Can't wait to see her again. And um, thank you so much to the sponsors for uh, setting up this memorial. I'm really glad you guys made sure it happened this year while, while I'm still here. Representative Sandridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What in the world is a conservation easement? I remember asking her that in 2018, January of 2018. And she came to my office, which was across the street, and gosh, did I get an education. I felt like an expert after that conversation. Um, she's the one who notified me, which as a city, city guy, you don't, don't think about rural issues that much. She's the one who educated me on rural issues, the extra struggles they have to deal with. Um, I learned so much from, from Kimmy. When I think of her, I think of principled and genuine. She's the type of person, of legislator that I strive to be. We all have models that we want to be like. Um, people we look up to and strive to be like that. We all have those. <laughs> we all have those. These five right here. Um, Kimmy was one of those. She was one of those that you strive to be a fighter and genuine and never back down. Um, I gotta say, I strive every day, but I fell a lot. 
and I'm going to keep on trying to be uh, like a Kimmy Lewis and be to that level. And it, and it really doesn't matter what party you're on. If you can just be genuine, a fighter, and be there for your people, um, you will be close to a Kimmy Lewis. So um, I think about her a lot. She guides me. And I know she's not here, but um, when I fight, she's here. So uh, this is a great day. I thank the family for being here. And um, I highly respect what we're doing this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ransom and Representative Sandridge. Representative Titone and Speaker Pro Tem Benavides. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't come up here because, uh, you know, I, I had my first impressions of Kimmy Lewis. I mean, to be honest, I was intimidated by her. <laughs> I mean, if you saw what passion she showed down here and talking about taking people to the woodshed, I mean, we all know what that means. She used to say that a lot, <laughs> right? And, you know, I mean, that was, I was a little intimidated by that. Uh, I, I didn't really know who she really was until later on, and it, it wasn't really until going down to her ranch and, and really meeting her and getting to spend some time with her and her family that I really got to know the person who she really was. I, I always think of Kimmy Lewis as, I mean, as people have said it before, generosity and compassion and, and fearlessness. I mean, you know, this job can be hard. We all have our struggles that we deal with outside this building, but I mean, think about what Kimmy had to deal with. Running a ranch in, in Eastern Colorado is incredibly difficult. And she told us some of the stories of some of the winters that they had to endure that were just, I mean, it, it boggles your mind how anybody could even survive in those conditions, but she, she did and she, worked so hard and she had all of these other things you know aside from running the ranch but all the, the the companies uh supporting her family all of these things were so hard and then on top of all that fighting cancer as well but she still came here and she still did her job and she still put a smile on her face and she never showed any of that she never showed any weakness she just did everything that she had to do. And the visits that she invited us down to uh, her ranch were just so, so wonderful. Just being able to hear from, from the people around the area and to have her open her house and, and her, her ranch and the generosity that she showed was just, you know, something that and I think I'll just echo what uh, Representative Sandridge said, you know, we should all be a little bit more like Kimmy Lewis, I agree. There's so much that we can learn from her and how she presented herself. And if we all just think about that a little bit and do that in our, in our daily lives, that's the legacy I think she wants. Thank you, Representative Tone. Madam Speaker, Pro Tem Benavides. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I also want to thank the family for being here. You know, the family was what was most important to Kimmy. Uh, her and I started in the legislature at the same time. And our first day of training, we have an orientation for new legislators. I sat next to her. And right away, she pointed out my name, uh, Adrian, because one of her grandchildren are named that. And we started talking about all the members of her family, including, I think it's a sister that's named Zella, which was my sister's name. And it's not a name that's very common and we don't hear. And throughout her time here, she'd always stop and give me an update on especially those two. And I remember one year she sent me an Easter card with the whole family out at the ranch. And she made sure to point out who was who, and everything about them. Um, because that was the thing about Kimmy. It, it was instilled on her as the matriarch of your family. She was so loving, and she was such a strong, fierce woman. And I think that's really 
why I admired her and always looked to her and the way that she talked about the issues that were important to her. I mean, she was hands down the absolutely best advocate for her constituents in this body since I've been here. You know, she would be there and she would tell you um, everything about the issue. She wouldn't, you know, bring in and read statistics or read um, a fiscal note or read anything. She was telling you exactly what was going on. I think one of my colleagues mentioned her um, uh, pictures that she would show, you know, but not only the pictures, but I recall once her descriptions of um, cattle bloodied in the field and having to go out and hunt the predators. You know, those kinds of descriptions made life in rural areas real, things that we don't all know about or understand. Um, and everything she spoke about was like that. And her and I didn't agree on most things, particularly conservation easements. But I'll tell you what, and, and Perry laughs because she sat next to me, is that she'd come over and say, I'm bringing an amendment. I said, I'm voting for it. I voted for all of her amendments because she was such a strong advocate for it. You know, that, that was enough for me. I, I wouldn't vote for the bill, but I would vote. Uh, because <laughs> it was, she would talk about the real impacts of what our decisions do here to people. And that's so important. That's what all of us need to hear. And again, she was so loving. I can't think of another person in this legislature that I learned so much from. And she is certainly missed. And for the family, you can see this is not just one side of the aisle. This is all of us here really miss her. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Uh, Representative D. Valdez and Assistant Minority Leader Geithner. Representative D. Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. And serving with Kimmy was an honor. You know, she covered a lot of ground, nine counties, and wore a lot of boots in this house. I remember talking to her, and I tell her, how long is it going to take you to get home? And she says, a long time, because I knew how long it took me to get home. But I'd always ask her, when's Brandon season coming around in the spring? Because that's one of my favorite times in the springtime is Brandon, when you get your family together and your friends and your neighbors, but also not only checking on your cattle, but making sure things are, are working right. And to her family, to her sister who was working side by side with her here at the State House, not a day went by that they continued to come together here in the chambers. To her daughters, to her sons, my heart was with you because she was a strong woman. And I remember meeting her in 2019 in Lahana at the Farm Credit Union. And she goes, I know who you are. You're Valdez, aren't you? I go, yes, I am. She goes, you come from the San Luis Valley. I said, yes. I didn't have to tell her too much about me because she knows who's my, who, who are my family. But she stood strong in here. And you go and ask her how she's doing when she was going through treatments, and she said, I'm, I'm doing good. She will be missed, but will be remembered in more ways than one for standing up here and fighting for rural Colorado every single day on aspects of agriculture, water, infrastructure, to making sure our roads were open, trying to get our, our roads plowed in the evening time so that we can get home but more importantly, fighting for, for beef, for the rancher's way of life, for our farmers today to make sure that our food and the products that we grow every single day had a voice. I want to thank my colleagues today, but also my colleagues that I served in prior for being here. 
And if there's anything I can help out with on the, on the ranch to the family, please let me know. It's an honor to serve with her and it will be remembered. Thank you. Thank you, Representative D. Valdez. Assistant Minority Leader Geithner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to the sponsors, thank you for bringing forward this memorial. <clears throat> um, you know, we, we've heard some comments about uh, being a young legislator or a first time legislator and coming in into this building and looking for who, who is the model? Who do, I, who do I emulate? Who can I learn from? Uh, both what to do and what not to do. Um, and I would say that, that Kimmy was certainly the one that, that I never wanted to disappoint. Not because I was afraid or intimidated, but because she had such a good natural quality, a genuineness inside of her. And I remember one of the first times coming out of this well after having the opportunity to speak, and it was a debate, I'm not even sure what the debate was about, but I remember she came, she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, good job, Tim. That has stuck with me. To the family, thank you for sharing her with us. <clears throat> thank you for the um, being there for her and encouraging her to do it. She was truly a, a good voice, a great voice uh, for rural Colorado. It was a pleasure to serve with her and just, uh, we miss you, Kimmy. Thank you, Assistant Minority Leader Geithner. Representative Catlin and Representative Holtorf. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the picture on the wall. That lady epitomizes rural Colorado. She loved her country. She loved her livelihood. Remember what she stood for when you do the work you do in this chamber because it meant everything to her and it means everything to her family who's over here on my right hand side. It was a pleasure, it's a privilege to serve in House District 64, representing Southeast Colorado, and there is no way I can fill her big boots. That is impossible. Although I've always looked to her leadership and thought, what would Kimmy do? How hard would she fight? And I wanted to fight just like her. Nobody stood up like Kimmy Lewis for rural Colorado, for private property rights, a lady who would push back on the overreach of every level of government, state government, federal government, and specifically the United States Army land grab in southeast Colorado, in the Pinion Canyon area. Make no mistake about it. She believed in freedom and the freedom to live the life without government interference that you want to live. I will tell you she's a proud member, was a proud member of the Colorado Independent Cattle Growers. She supported USA Beef and our calf. The Lewis family should be proud today, very proud of their sister, of their mother, of their grandmother, as I am proud to follow in her footsteps. I'm also very proud that this chamber has helped to provide the flags that flew over the Capitol that are going to be offered to her family. Please display them with pride for the most tenacious stateswoman I have ever known, Kimmy Clark Lewis. Thank you, Representative Holtworth. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. Honor to serve with you too, Representative Catlin. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm down here because to begin with, I didn't know that lady. I knew the lady that came to this room dressed and ready. She was always dressed up to be in town to do the job that her people had sent her to do. And she did that job. She did it in ways that you've heard be impressive. I've heard the words tough, fierce brusque. Okay. But I haven't heard advocate a couple of times, patriot. But the one that really was left out in my mind was friend. She had the capability of being a friend. I've, we've talked about it across the aisle. She was able to be a friend with someone, but yet 
not agree with you, which is a very special quality. It's a special quality for people in this world, let alone in this room. She and I butted heads. We did. But we were always friends. You know, I think one of the things that impressed me as much as anything is one day I was outside here smoking a cigarette, which don't tell anybody. <laughs> and she came up to me and said, you know, that's not good for you. I said, yeah, I'm, yeah I do. I'm sorry. She said, it's dinner time. Let's go over and eat lunch. So we went over to the Capitol Grill, and my wife was with me, and we went and had lunch. And it was just one of those lunches. It was not about the legislature. It was not about the state of Colorado. It was about us having lunch, which is, stands out in my mind. We had a number of phone calls through the summer and all of the you know, interim seasons and all those kind of things, matching up where we're at, what's going on. But that day was simply a friend. And it was, it was good. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I still miss the Capitol Grill more than anything else in the building. But that kind of identifies who she was. She was very special. And you people sitting along the wall know that. But we thought she was special. That's what I'm hoping you will take with you today when you go home. She was a good example. She was a good legislator. She had her ducks in a row before she ever stepped into the arena. She knew what she wanted. She knew about how to go get it. But that probably identifies the lady in the picture. She knew what she wanted, and she knew how to go about getting it. But the lady that sat up here dressed up and ready to be in town, she knew how to get it too. So that's impressive when you can bring all of that together and put that in one package. And that package was Kimmy Lewis, probably one of the most the biggest memory I've got of her, and I don't want to carry on too long, is she had passion for her bills. And there was a day when her bill didn't make it. And she, she got out of the room quickly. Well, I happened to bump into her outside here, and she was crying. And she looked at me and said, these Damn tears. I, you know, I thought to myself, I know exactly how that feels. But she didn't want anyone in this room or in this building to know that she'd cried that day. She didn't ask me to not tell anybody, but you could tell. And you know, when that kind of emotion comes from a person over something they're so passionate about, you can't help but be impressed. Because she was having a moment outside that she knew she had to wipe the tears, take a deep breath, and go after the next thing. And she was capable of doing that. She was capable of doing that as a lady and she managed herself as a lady, for those of you who don't know her. She was a lady first, and always was. Now, she could cuss you if she had to, <laughs> but she was a lady, and that's impressive. She never dropped that part of her personality. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons that today is a special day. We are, you know, all commenting on what we remember. What I'm hoping is that we will carry that forward with us today 
and from all, all the way out, particularly till the end of the session. You know, I've, I have passion, but I don't have the passion that that lady did. One thing she did do for me is that we will continue to look at conservation easements. And we will do that for her, what she wanted to do. But what that was is that she had this, this incredible capability of handing you a job. This is going to be your job. Sometimes she would say that, sometimes she wouldn't, but you knew when you were done with that conversation that you just picked up a job and you needed to carry the ball. For that, she is unforgettable. For those of you that are sitting on that side of the building, the little ones, she loved you to the bone. Her children were always first in her mind and in her heart. So I'm not sure if she was a cattle woman or a mom or a legislator first. I think it hap had to happen on the day that she was dealing with. But we're all proud that we knew her. And she will carry a very special spot in a lot of our hearts and minds. Thank you for bringing and letting her bring us together at this building. Thank you for loving her enough to fulfill her need to be of service to the community that raised her. Because it takes a family, believe me. <laughs> that one I brought with me is struggling sometimes too. But anyway, to Kimmy Lewis, to a beautiful memory, to a very special person, we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Catlin. Minority Leader McKean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and truly, um, Pat, I'll lay this on your shoulders, Representative Neville. You, thank you for bringing this. Thank you for being steadfast like Kimmy would have been to say, you know what, this is, this is a tribute to a remarkable human being. So thank you. Um, I'm wearing a tie today because I came in the chamber a few years ago and Kimmy said, what's on your tie? And I said, Mickey Mouse. And she said, that's about right. <laughs> I knew Kimmy before I knew Kimmy. In fact, I, I got to know Kimmy through Christine, who was a pilot. And I got to hear just what a good pilot she was. And I got to hear um, what an amazing person she was. And I got to, to meet her and, and to start to experience this family from somebody who Kimmy raised. And we say it and we mean it, but I don't know that we ever mean it quite as much as with Kimmy. Her, her life's work is her kids. Her life's work is all of you. And we mean it when we say thank you for sharing her here because it meant that she had to get on the road early and she had to get up here and spend her weeks here doing things that, you know, I think at times just made her mad. And then of course she came home and no telling, she probably put spurs on before she started riding that day. But I got to know Kimmy before I knew her and then there we were at state assembly and Christine came up and said, hey, I want you to meet my mom. And she's thinking about running for the state house. And so I went around the corner and I was sitting talking to Kimmy and a couple other people when Daryl Glenn gave the best speech of his life. And I hear this uproar in, in, the, in the auditorium. And I said, should we go in and, and, and hear it? And Kimmy looked at me and she said, I think this is more important. We're making decisions that I have to live with. That's how I met Kimmy Lewis. And we would disagree on detail, but never on principle. You heard a, a mention of sitting in, in her office. I was sitting right next to Representative Gray, and she was trying to tell us how badly affected the constituents of her district were when they had been lumped into these big recreation districts. 
And she said, they're paying taxes on something they're never going to use. And she went on, and she got a little more emotional, a little more emotional. And, and I remember she started to cry. And I said, Kimmy, you can't cry in committee. She said, the hell I can't. She said, that's how much I feel about this issue. And this is how much I feel for those people in my district. There are a few people in this building that touch our lives forever. There are a few people in our lives that touch our lives forever. But in this building, there are people who are a light and a beacon for how we ought to do this job. Kimmy Lewis was that beacon for all of us to be unswervingly committed to the things that were important, not just to her, but to her people. And not just to her people, but to this state. And that's something I think that when we talk about urban and rural and, you know what, Kimmy could come down here and she could pound on this podium and she could talk about her rural folks, but she never lost focus of what was good for the state. And that meant it was all of us. So if anything, let's take away just that cherished ability to say that we knew someone special, that we had someone shine that light into our lives, but that she made us better. And for that, Kimmy, I will always thank you. Thank you, Minority Leader McKean. Um, and right before we go to Representative Neville, I just want to thank the family for being here. Uh, Representative Lewis was very good at reminding me, uh, as a young father, how important family was. She put you guys before everything, and uh, she reminded me the importance of being a good dad and always being there. So thanks for sharing her with us. Thanks for being here today. She truly was a very, very special person. Representative Neville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under Rule 26F, I request that we do a brief recess so that we can allow former members to speak. See no objection as I lose my script up here. The House will be in a recess to hear from former members. Representative Navarro, nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you all for having us here today to remember a wonderful, wonderful person. Kimmy Lewis was a force to be reckoned with. I always admired Representative Lewis's passion for land, family, and her God. As someone who served next to her, I always knew when she came to this podium, it was with a servant's heart for her people that she represented. If something wasn't right, or if something, something didn't match her values and the values of her constituents, she'd be the first to speak up. She was certainly a champion for the rural way of life and would not bend when it came to protecting Colorado's farmers and ranchers. Colorado is a better place because of Representative Lewis, and this chamber is blessed to have been graced with her presence. She is sincerely missed. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Navarro. Representative Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to say a few words um, as a tribute to Kimmy Lewis, and especially for the family. I'm glad that you have today a glimpse of what your mom and sister and grandmother got to experience and how she touched the lives of so many of us in this building. Kimmy and I got to overlap by two years serving together and then those two years, um, I clearly remember I was uh, in the committee that uh, received her two bills each year on um, conservation easements. And um, the passion and uh, how many constituents took so much time to be able to come and testify really on her behalf that she would say it's worth it for you to make an extraordinary amount of effort to come and testify. And out of uh, my years here and all the committees that I attended, um, I remember the second one, I really got choked up. She was so passionate, so fervent in what she meant. Um, 
that I really appreciate her. One of the things we had in common, Kimmy and I, that we talked about often enough was each, we both had six children. And um, we would get, have that in common that we would talk about the challenges and the passion and the joys that we would have and, and the heartache when the, tough, the times were tough on watching kids grow up. She was definitely the gold standard for legislators. She cared about our constituents. She knew their values that were her values. And every one of you sent exactly the right person into this chamber to represent you from her district. So I want to thank you for sharing a little bit of your mom and your sister and your grandmother with us. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Leonard. Representative Everett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you, family, for sharing Kimmy with us. I think you've heard that time and time again. And you know, thank you, legislators and former legislators and current legislators. I think, unfortunately and unfortunately, I've probably sat through a number of memorials, and I've never seen this amount of people on both sides of the aisle get up and speak for someone. And that's just amazing to me on this bipartisan fashion, how we're doing things. And to the family, I mean, I, that should emphasize how important Kimmy was, not only to everybody in this chamber that knew her, but obviously to everybody in the state of Colorado. Uh, people touched upon that Kimmy had a good sense of humor. And uh, for those of you that know me, I like to kind of mess with people. And so day three of Kimmy serving down here, and I didn't know Kimmy that well. She sort of observed me messing with some people and then decided to see if I could give as good as I could get. And I, in my 50 years on God's green earth, I've never met somebody that could give better than she did. I mean, honestly, I mean, she would, right now, my hair's a little bit long, and she would probably take me aside because she would think it would be disrespectful to tease me in front of people and say, cut your hair, you hippie. <laughs> and, uh, or maybe to Representative Neville or former Representative uh, Leonard or even Representative Humphrey, she said, shave your beard, hippies. And uh, that was just Kimmy. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little surprised, and, and maybe we haven't gotten through everybody yet, but there's a, a story that Kimmy hated that I heard when I was visiting rural Colorado, and, and people were telling me this story about how she was 16, and uh, she was in a helicopter, and there was a major snowstorm, one of those epic snowstorms that hit, you know, uh, southeastern Colorado, and there was a calf in the snow. And I know the family has probably heard this one a million times. And she was in a helicopter, and as the story goes, and I may be embellishing a little bit, but that's how I heard it, she jumped out of the helicopter into this deep snow to save this calf. And Kimmy's a very tough, strong woman, and somehow got this calf back into the helicopter and uh, saved the calf. And she made the local newspaper for doing this. I mean, she was 16 at the time. And, you know, I, I said to Kimmy, I came back from a trip to southeastern Colorado, and I you know, told her the story. I'm like, how come we have never heard this story before? And she just hated that story. Because to Kimmy, it was a natural reflex to her to do the right thing, to do the brave thing. I mean, to her, it's like, of course anybody would do that, jump out of a helicopter. And then she, would, she told me that the end of the story that didn't make the paper, apparently, was the calf rewarded everybody who saved her in the helicopter um, by relieving herself all over the helicopter, reading the helicopter. And that's sort of what Kimmy remembers from the story. But that's the thing. Kimmy thought doing the right thing, doing the brave thing was a reflex. And I think that's something that we should all take to heart you know, as we serve in this chamber, uh, also in life. Because it shouldn't have to be, it should be a reflex to do the right thing. You shouldn't have to think about it, shouldn't think about the politics, just do the right thing. And I feel truly blessed to call Kimmy friend, and I truly miss her. I know God had welcomed her into heaven, and God bless you all, and thank you, Kimmy, for giving us a piece of you here at the legislature. God bless. Thank you, Representative Everett. Representative Buck. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and everybody has said it so beautifully. Um, so beautifully well, and it's uh, humbling to join you all today. Um, I definitely want to thank the family members for allowing Kimmy to, to serve. Um, I know how important she was to all of you. Uh, but where do I start? I would say that she was a sister from another mother. She was that big sister that I never had. And I just miss her 
so much. It seems like it just all happened uh, yesterday. But I had learned that she had lost her husband from cancer, and you know, with six children, uh, that had to have been such a de devastating blow. And she did not wallow, though, in despair. She tightened that cinch, put the bridle on, and got back on that horse. She was my hero in so many ways, serving as a legislator the way she did, being a mother the way she was, taking care of the animals the way she did. She was absolutely amazing. Um, and as a minority in, this, in the chambers, there was nobody that fought harder for her constituents than Kimmy Lewis. Kimmy, until we see each other again, I love you, girlfriend. God bless. Thank you, Representative Buck. Representative Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's good to see you. Um, good to see everybody here today. Um, it's always a little different kind of coming back years later and, and to see some of the band back together here to, to talk about Kimmy. Um, I sat next to her and was, it was really a, um, a blessing. Um, she was such a, a sincere person. And she would, um, every once in a while, she just kind of, <clears throat> you know, kind of step over. We'd be chatting in between a bill going on or something, and she'd say, Steve, between you, me, and the fence post here, and she'd go on and share something, you know, that she wanted kind of kept in confidence, but that was going on in her life. And, and one of the, the, the thing I think that really made her um, the great individual that, that we, you've all, you know, heard all the, all the stories here um, this morning or afternoon, wherever it is now, um, it was just that she was such a character person, and I think that was really because of her, her faith um, and her family. And I just wanted to read um, a few words written by the Apostle Paul, a few sentences. It means they're not necessarily short, but this won't be really long. This is Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because of the works of the law, none of mankind will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. But it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in God's merciful restraint, he let the sins previously committed go unpunished for the demonstration that is of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And I think that's really her great, great testimony and why we um, remember so many wonderful things about her. And, um, you know, I loved her. I know, you know, many of you did. And I look forward to seeing her again. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Humphrey. Representative Sane. There we go. There we go. I do want you to know, Representative Sane, that Representative A. Valdez has carried on your legacy. He just comes from the other side when he does it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Kimmy Clark Lewis represented generations of settlers who scratched and wrought a living out of the wild and savage, beautiful West. She was as genuine as the land and the people she represented. Kimmy grew up bigger than the challenges she faced, but few tall tales start with anything less. We knew her here in the Capitol as bigger than life, an American patriot, a wrangler of cattle and tarantulas. 
killer of wolves and a champion of common sense, and as an ambassador for the families who scrap and save for everything they have on the plains, and she never did anything halfway. Nothing is simple in rural Colorado, though it may seem to be to those who in the urban areas, those city dwellers who are upheld and supplied by those in the country. In eastern Colorado, you only survive by outlasting the harsh elements and the harsher reality. For those who only experience water that comes from a tap and wheat and vegetables and grain that come from a supermarket, Kimmy provided you with the understanding of the difficulties it takes to produce those essentials. Kimmy Lewis not only represented, she personified the farmers, ranchers, and pioneers that cultivated the Eastern Plains to bring forth those things that allow the rest of us to live in suburbs and cities. And she rallied and railed against those who passed laws and regulations without understanding that made it harder to survive in rural Colorado and produce those same things, those goods and services that ben benefit not only Colorado, but the entire nation. I never saw Kimmy surrender anything that should be fought for. And she bore chemotherapy without complaint and carried on her job as a state representative with the fire and gritty determination of the Eastern Plains that she loved. When Representative Beckman and I had the privilege of visiting her in the last days just before Thanksgiving, she was still giving an instruction on what needed to happen in the 2020 session and what bills needed to be run. She worked to the very, very end. She never surrendered to anyone other than her Lord Jesus. And I imagine, I suppose, the death itself had to come after her three times until I had to ask her for permission to leave with her on the ranch. <laughs> Kimmy Lewis is my friend, not was. Because there is no past tense for those in Christ. When Kimmy opened her eyes, she was healed and with her Lord because to be absent in the body is to be with Christ. And I know that she wouldn't want any of you, and she didn't want to leave many of you behind and want you to be with her. So if you'd like to know how to do this, please see me afterwards. Thank you for her family for being here today and for your support that allowed Kimmy to be with us. As you have heard, her spirit sustains the chamber and the echoes of her passion still resound and repeat in every rural Colorado debate. This portrait that's hung in my office was waiting for this day. It's a last present to you, the family, from this Republican caucus that served with her. I'm sure it provided some inspiration in the meantime, in the late nights and early mornings in the Capitol when the members huddled together in 212 and regrouped to work a little longer, a little harder, and push through the pain. And Kimmy would love nothing more than if you would continue to serve her people with respect and with love. And in this worthy memorial today, we are reminded and encouraged to strive to be worthy of the greeting that I'm sure she received in heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Stain. Are there any former representatives who would like to speak? Seeing none, the House will come back to order. The motion before us, is there any further discussion on House Memorial 1002? Seeing none. The question before us is the adoption of House Memorial 1002. Is there any objection to a voice vote? Seeing none. The question before us is the adoption of House Memorial 1002. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Memorial 1002 is adopted. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Later this week, the nation will be celebrating National Superhero Day. And I think in light of all of the comments that were shared and all of the stories that show um, Kimmy Lewis was a superhero. And so as a result, I move that the current roll call of the House be added as co-sponsors. 
Seeing no objection, this morning's roll call will be added as co-sponsors. Representative Neville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to um, introduce the family, and then after we introduce the family, I'll, I'll request a recess, but so we can present. We have flags here that Representative Williams and Representative Holtorfer have, and then we also have the portrait here that we'd like to give to the family. But to introduce the family, and if you guys would please stand as, as I call your names. But we have uh, Kimmy's sisters present here. Uh, we have Kathy from Springfield. And we have uh, Karen Sparky from um, Denver, Colorado. And then online, uh, many of you probably remember her from working with Kimmy, but Julie Sumter from Parker, Colorado is watching online. She's watching uh, one of Kimmy's one-year-old grandsons. And then we have Kimmy's children present here. We have Kelly Wasson with grandchildren Michaela, Mitchell, and Macy. We have Kenneth Lewis with his wife Stacy and grandchildren Gracie, Isabella, and Gino. We have Carrie Frazee with grandchildren Adrian, Eli, and Adeline. We have Christine Lewis with grandchildren Electra, Davy, and June. And we have Corey Lewis from Branson, Colorado. And then he might be watching online as well, but he was with us when we did the um, tribute a couple years back. But Keith, Keith Lewis, who has grandchildren Kendall, Landry, Paisley, and Ridge. Please give the, the family a hand for being here. And I, I think Representative Sane probably said it best, and I think the words that I want to convey to is that Kimmy was one of those ones that never surrendered to anyone but her Lord Jesus. I am confident she was secure in her salvation and is watching down on us now and is with our Lord. But at this time, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd request to take a brief recess so we could greet the family. The House will be in a brief recess. <laughs>
Okay, everybody. The house will come back to order. Let's start slowly making our way back to our seats. And we'll go to Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to proceed out of order for immediate consideration of third reading of bills, final passage. Seeing no objection, we will proceed out of order for immediate consideration of third reading of bills, final passage. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay over Senate Bill, Senate Bill 9, Senate Bill 167, Senate Bill 58, Senate Bill 164 till the end of the third reading calendar. Seeing no objection, Senate Bill 9, 167, 58, and 164 will be laid over to the end of the third reading calendar. Mr. Shebel, please read the title to House Bill 1290. House Bill 1290 by Representative Statone Ortiz, also Senator Zenzinger and Quorum, concerning changes to Medicaid to allow for expedited repairs of complex rehabilitation technology and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1290 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1290 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Representative Hooten is excused. Please close the machine. With 47 I votes, 15 no votes, and three excused, House Bill 1290 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title to House Bill 1310. House Bill 1310 by Representatives Larson and Kipp, also Senators Bridges and Woodward, concerning the alignment of the state income tax deduction for contributions to a 529 account with the changes in the federal setting every community up for retirement enhancement act of 2019 that allows tax-free distributions for eligible apprenticeship programs. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1310 on third reading, final passage. Question of course is the adoption of House Bill 1310 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. <clears throat> Please close the machine. With 62 I votes, one no vote, and two excuse, House Bill 1310 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1320. 
House Bill 1320 by Representatives Kippen Larson, also Senator Zenzinger and Woodward, concerning the Achieving a Better Life Experience ABLE Savings Program for Individuals with Disabilities and in connection therewith, modifying who may create and control an ABLE Program account, preventing the state from filing certain claims against an ABLE Program account upon the death of a designated beneficiary and allowing contributions to an ABLE Program account that are withdrawn for qualified disability expenses to be deducted from a taxpayer's federal taxable income for purposes of determining the taxpayer's state taxable income and making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Did you catch that? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1320 on third reading final passage. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1320. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 63 aye votes, zero no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1320 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1325. House Bill 1325 by Representatives Kennedy and Caravello, also Senator Janal, concerning alternative payment models for primary care services and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1325 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1325 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Sheeple, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Please close the machine. With 39 aye votes, 24 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1325 is adopted. Co sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1315 or 1350. House Bill 1350 by Representatives McCluskey and Rich, also Senators Bridges and Lundeen, concerning the creation of a grant program to meet workforce needs throughout the state. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Move House Bill 1350 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1315 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Majority Leader. Please close the machine. With 52 aye votes, 11 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1350 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1354. House Bill 1354 by Representatives Lindsay and Michael Sinjanay, also Senator Winter, concerning mental health and workers' compensation cases. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1354 and third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1354 and third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Please close the machine. With 53 aye votes, 10 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1354 is adopted. Co-sponsors.
Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1368. House Bill 1368 by Representative Herod, also Senator Rodriguez, concerning opportunities for persons to access community corrections programs. Rep uh, Majority Leader Oscar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1368 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1368 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Please close the machine. With 42 I votes, 21 no votes, and two excuse, House Bill 1368 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1373. House Bill 1373 by Representative Gonzalez Gutierrez, also Senator Gonzalez, concerning prohibiting courts from ordering juveniles to pay restitution to insurance companies. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1373 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1373 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion, Mr. Schiebel. Please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Please close the machine. With 38 aye votes, 25 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1373 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1360. House Bill 1360 by Representatives to Tony Baisley, also Senator Kolker, concerning authorizing the Department of Human Services to retain a percentage of the federal child support incentive payments the state receives. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1360 on third reading, final passage. The question of force is the adoption of House Bill 1360 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 55 I votes, 8 no votes, and 2 excuse, House Bill 1360 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1233. House Bill 1233 by Representatives Lontin and Sober, also Senator Simpson and Janaw, concerning the continuation of the regulation of optometry by the State Board of Optometry and a connection therewith, implementing recommendations in the 2021 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1233 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1233 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. 
Representative Haynes votes yes. Please close the machine. With 55 I votes, 8 no votes, and 2 excuse, House Bill 1233 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, Majority Leader Oscar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay over Senate Bill 79, Senate Bill 110, Senate Bill 156 to the end of the third reading calendar. Senate Bill 79, Senate Bill 110, and Senate Bill 156 will be laid over to the end of the third reading calendar. Seeing no objection. Major, Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1091. House Bill 1091 by Representatives Soper and Weissman, also Senators Gardner and Bridges, concerning the online availability of opinions issued by Colorado courts and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1091 on third reading final passage. The question before us is the, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1091 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Sheeble, will please open the machine and members please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. We rarely get a photo together. Please close the machine. With 63 I votes, zero no votes, and two excuse, House Bill 1091 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title of the House Bill 1114. House Bill 1114 by Representatives Larson and Valdez A, also Senators Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer, concerning authorizing a transportation network company to provide non-medical non transportation services to persons who are enrolled in certain Medicaid waiver programs and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1114 on third reading final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1114 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine. And members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 52 I votes, 11 no votes, and two excuse, House Bill 1114 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title to House Bill 1356. 
House Bill 1356 by Representatives Herdon Hoot and also Senators Gonzalez and Rankin concerning the creation of the small community-based nonprofit infrastructure grant program to provide assistance to nonprofit organizations that have been economically impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Oscar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1356 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1356 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. <clears throat> Please close the machine. With 44 aye votes, 19 no votes, and two excuse, House Bill 1356 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title of House Bill 1042. House Bill 1042 by Representatives Exman Van Winkle, also Senators Buckner and Heisey, concerning the ability of a teen parent to attend driving school without a cost and in connection there with making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1042 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1042 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Representative Hanks, one more shot. Representative Hanks is excused. Please close the machine. With 51 aye votes, 11 no votes, and three excused, House Bill 1042 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title to House Bill 1284. House Bill 1284 by Representatives Esgar and Catlin, also Senators Gardner and Pedersen, concerning updates to state surprise billing laws to facilitate the implementation of surprise billing protections and in connection therewith aligning state law with the Federal No Surprises Act and making an appropriation. Majority Leader Esgar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1284 and third reading final passage, which is a favorable recommendation. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1284 and third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 63 aye votes, zero no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1284 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title to House Bill oh, Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay over House Bill 1285 one day until tomorrow, April 26th. Seeing no objection, House Bill 1285 will be laid over one day until Tuesday, April 26th. 
Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1351. House Bill 1351 by Representatives Roberts and McLaughlin, also Senator Pedersen, concerning a temporary reduction in the total amount of road user charges to be imposed during the state fiscal year 2022-23 and 2023-24, and in connection therewith, tempor temporarily reducing gas prices and making an appropriation. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1351 on third reading, final passage. The question of force is the adoption of House Bill 1351 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine, and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Please close the machine. With 38 aye votes, 25 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1351 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1379. House Bill 1379 by Representatives McCormick and Catlin, also Senators Donovan and Simpson, concerning transfers from the Economic Recovery and Relief Cash Fund to provide additional funding for the management of certain natural resources and a connection there with making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1379 on third reading, final passage. The question of force is the adoption of House Bill 1379 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 58 aye votes, five no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1379 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1352. House Bill 1352 by Representative Mullica, also Senator Hawkins Lewis, concerning a stockpile of essential materials that may be utilized in the event of a declared disaster emergency and in connection there with making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1352 on third reading, final passage. The question before you is the adoption, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1352 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion, Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. Oh. Please close the machine. With 42 yes votes, 21 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1352 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1005. House Bill 1005 by Representatives McCluskey and Will, also Senator Rankin, concerning modifications to the existing tax credit for rural and frontier health care preceptors. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1005 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1005 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes.
Please close the machine. With 53 aye votes, 10 no votes, and two excuse, House Bill 1005 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1053. House Bill 1053 by Representatives Valdez D. and Van Beber, also Senator Hansen, concerning the use of blockchain technology in commerce and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Jordi Ledresco. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 10053 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1053 on third reading and final passage. Sorry, I screwed that up. Um, Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Sheeple, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Please close the machine. With 46 I votes, 17 no votes, and two excuse House Bill 1053 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title of the House Bill 1364. Oh wait, I'm sorry, 1215. House Bill 1215 by Representatives McCluskey and Bacon, also Senator Bridges, concerning expanding opportunities for high school students to enroll in post-secondary courses and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority of the director. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1215 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1215 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Please close the machine. With 48 aye votes, 15 no votes, and two excuse, House Bill 1215 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title of the House Bill 1364. House Bill 1364 by Representatives Cutter and Sober, also Senator Story, concerning extension of the Food Pantry Assistant Grant Program and in connection there with making an appropriation. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1364 and third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1364 and third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Please close the machine. With 43 aye votes, 20 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1364 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title to House Bill 1246. <coughs> House Bill 1246 by Representative Lantine, also Senator Buckner, concerning the registration of a pharmacy located within a hospice inpatient unit as a specialized prescription drug outlet and in connection there with making an appropriation. Majority Leader Esquire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1246 on third reading, final passage. 
The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1246 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? <clears throat> yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 60 aye votes, three no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1246 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1382. House Bill 1382 by Representatives McCluskey and Catlin, also Senator Donovan, concerning the designation and promotion of dark sky locations in Colorado. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1382 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1382 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Please close the machine. With 46 I votes, 17 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1382 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Concurrent Resolution 1003. House Concurrent Resolution 1003 by Representatives Geithner and Kipp, also Senators Bridges and Lundin, submitting to the registered electors of the state of Colorado an amendment to the Colorado Constitution concerning the extension of the property tax exemption for qualified seniors and disabled veterans to the surviving spouse of a United States Armed Force Service member who died in the line of duty or veteran whose death resulted from a service-related injury or disease. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay it over. I'm just kidding. Minority Leader. Assistant Minority Leader. I move HCR 1003 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Concurrent Resolution 1003 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hanks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 63 aye votes, zero no votes, and two excuse, House Concurrent Resolution 1003 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1326. House Bill 1326 by Representatives Garnett and Lynch, also Senators Pedersen and Cook, concerning measures to address synthetic opiates and in connection therewith changing the criminal penalties associated with synthetic opiates, using a substance abuse assessment to direct appropriate treatment at sentencing, providing opiate antagonists in the community, providing synthetic opiate detection tests in the community, create, creating immunity for furnishing synthetic opiate detection tests, providing treatment for person, persons in the criminal justice system, developing a fentanyl prevention and education program, campaign, excuse me, providing funding for substance abuse and harm reduction, evaluating the substance abuse and harm reduction needs across the state, requiring a post-enactment review of the implementation of this act and making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1326 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1326 on third reading and final passage. Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, there's a lot of good stuff in this bill. I like what we're trying to do to crack down on distribution of fentanyl. 
I especially like what we're trying to do to invest in public health and harm reduction to try to save people's lives. And for those of us who have served on the Opioid and Other Substance Use Disorders Committee for the last several years, it's great that we have 65 people in this chamber now who are trying to save lives of people who might be victims of an overdose death. That was not always the case, and I think it's, it's helpful that we are all talking about this together. Now, there are always going to be differences of opinion. I am grateful to the hard work of Speaker Garnett and Representative Lynch to try to strike the right balance here. But I'm, I'm hung up on the felony. Um, and I think that that's, it's really challenging. Uh, you know, I think that I've had a lot of conversations, including corresponding with my own county sheriff, asking him to help me understand exactly how it is that charging and arresting someone for a felony rather than a misdemeanor increases the probability that their life is saved, that other people's lives are saved, and I've been pretty unsatisfied with the answers that I've heard. But here's what I've heard. I've heard first, deterrence. When you're talking about people that are addicted to a substance, deterrence is not how it works. No one is who's dealing with an addiction is going to think, oh my gosh, this is a felony rather than a misdemeanor, I guess I'd better not buy drugs today. That's just not how this works. I've heard number two, try to force people into treatment. Now, I think there are a lot of concerns about whether forced treatment works. I'm not saying you shouldn't try, right? We want to make sure we reach out every opportunity we can to, to get people signed up for treatment. But here's where I'm confused about this one is, if you arrest someone for a misdemeanor, you have the exact same opportunity to try to get them into treatment as you do if you arrest them for a felony. So again, on that, I don't see exactly how the felony solves this problem. Third, I've heard that you use the felony to try to get a better plea deal, to try to help get someone to unveil who their dealer is and try to go after the bigger fish in the distribution chain. That's a valid theory, but again, I don't know why that's different when you're talking about a felony versus a misdemeanor. Lots of people out there are very motivated to try to get a misdemeanor charge dismissed. I think they would be very motivated to try to help go after the dealers as well if they were going to make a deal at all. A thing that was not brought up by folks, but it is really the only thing that, that makes sense when I ask what people are trying to accomplish, is the idea of casting a broader net. When you cast a broad net and incarcerate people for possession, is the hope that perhaps some people who are dealing are caught up in that net? It's an understandable theory, but I have a habeas corpus problem with that. I'm pretty concerned about the idea that we are arresting and charging them for one thing when the real intent is to go after something else, where we're talking about depriving people of their liberty for something they did not in fact do, which is distribute drugs, where you cannot prove that they distributed drugs. What we're saying is that possession of a certain quantity implies that you necessarily must have been intending to distribute. And I just don't think the facts are there to back that up. So with respect to the sponsors and the folks who are really trying to solve problems, I really believe that everyone working on this bill is trying to save lives here. But I believe that the felony will hurt more people than it helps and will take more lives than it saves. Now, a lot of work has been done. A lot of good amendments were added in the House. I hope that they continue that effort in the Senate and add more amendments to mitigate some of the harms. I particularly want to see us making sure that every single jail in Colorado is offering comprehensive medication-assisted treatment services. Because if you are incarcerated because you have a fentanyl addiction, you need that treatment. Or if you're not, then when you get released, you are going to die of an overdose because after having been without that drug in your system for so long, you are that much more, more vulnerable to an overdose death upon release, and the science is there to show that. So again, this is a really hard one. I, I totally understand that there are going to be some differences among both caucuses on this question, but for my part, today I'll be voting no. Representative Judah. Representative Bacon. Thank you. Um, I'm up here to speak as well, just so that we can be sure um, that we can register some of the notes that we find to be important about the conversation. Um, and I'm leading with that because um, all of us have been a part of figuring out components of this bill. And so what brings me up here today is quite honestly just to register some notes on where we think there may be room um, to have continued conversations. 
but also to register some of the concerns about the parameters of this bill and how it may impact our communities. Either way, you know, my vote is going to kind of be ceremonial in, if you will, to be able to register that there are some concerns with this component, with certain components of the bill. Ultimately, we know that what our communities are experiencing with fentanyl have moved us into a place of it being a public health crisis. There are pieces of things that we need to do to support our communities, our families, and loved ones to be able to navigate it. I think that does include the educational components, being able to put resources out there to save lives, whether it is Narcan or test strips. Um, we also have been able to really talk about uh, treatment and services in this conversation as well. Moreover, I'd like to add that the conversation around dealing um, and quite frankly, what it means to have people poisoned by this drug is really important for us to hone in on as well. The thing that I think changed this bill from the conversation of harm reduction and accountability in regards to the drugs hitting the streets was when we put possession on the table. And unfortunately, conversations about possession need to be different to that of dealing and distribution. There are three ways that we talk about drugs in our statutes. We talk about use, we talk about possession, and we talk about dealing and distribution. And the reason why we talk about use differently and possession differently than distribution is because of the mindsets and who it is that we want to say is the root cause of the issue. What also comes to us when we put a felony on the table is that we have to think critically on how it aligns with other laws and other liberties and rights. And I don't feel like we have had the space to really audit that to make sure we are consistent throughout what we are doing and saying to get to the outcomes in which we want to see. Before this conversation, use and possession were misdemeanors and above four grams were felonies for the presumption around dealing. But now we have thrown those series of laws out of whack when it comes to the consequences. Furthermore, the conversation around possession. We have taken on substance abuse. We have said under this dome that we know this is an issue in which we need to stamp out some of the root causes. But when we associate felony charges, even so much so that part of our conversation said regardless, you know, even at zero grams, we have to be able to discern, we have to be able to say, being poisoned and being culpable of a felony cannot arise out of the same circumstance. We have to be able to say, if we want to address substance abuse, what are the best practices around it? And even though from judiciary to here, we've had conversations, at the end of the day, I find myself feeling like the conversation around possession has been led from a lens of law enforcement and not from substance abuse. I did not run to be a district attorney. I did not run to be law enforcement. I ran to be a lawmaker. And when we are making laws about this issue, I think that we need to understand from the people who have expertise in substance abuse, clinical detoxing and crisis stabilization should be just as prevalent as those who will see people on the streets. And the evidence that was shared to me about why we need to felonize possession at the risk of being inconsistent elsewhere in our laws at the risk of 
restricting liberties and opportunities for people that come when you have a felony arrest record, not even conviction. We needed to have additional insights. So, and so I'm speaking here to register that concern. Concern that we're talking about forced treatment more than we're talking about voluntary treatment. And so we have the resources and abilities to be sure that we can address an approach to this that has been validated by those who do this work with more strength than I feel we are at this moment. So the last thing I'd like to say is that it was really important for me, and I would even say for my colleagues, to be sure we heard from all of the parents and the families who spoke to us. And truth be told, it is also important to me to be sure that I do not tokenize those voices to strengthen my own arguments. We heard from our families, we heard parents say kids don't need to be incarcerated, and some of them said that perhaps it would have saved a life. We also heard people using one gram of pure fentanyl versus a gram of any substance with any presence of fentanyl interchangeably, and they're not. And we need to be very careful and very clear about that as a legislature, particularly as we build laws around this issue. And again, the thing that we heard most consistently was that people are poisoned by this drug and to associate then a felony crime for a leverage point that comes at real actual costs to the state, whether you use a public defender in prosecuting a felony or to families in the thousands of dollars. And then to not be able to perhaps navigate your way out of that system because you don't have resources is too much of a burden and unfair, particularly for those we know. Maybe just wanted to get to sleep or use something that they thought was otherwise legal, and so much more. So again, I do think we have additional conversations that we need to have, and my vote will be to register those to demonstrate that there is a willingness to draw a line, but more importantly, a hope that we don't have to. And so I hope my words really just mark that. But at the end of the day, I do want to thank everyone who's given their time, their work, their sympathies, and their consideration to this bill, because this is something that this body has to deeply deliberate on. And I envy no one, particularly because I know we all may have lost some sleep over it. So I want to thank everyone in this building as well for their grace on their consideration of this bill but I hope we can think about these things deeply. Thank you. Representative Larson. Represent Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> I actually don't usually come down here on thirds, so um, I just wanna recall in some of the things that I heard um, over the last week, I heard um, somebody say, or disparaged drug users. And so I just wanna level set here on that and, and say that those drug users are um, someone's mother, they're someone's father, they're their son, their daughter, their sister, and their brother. I think my colleague um, said I, I, words that I um, that resonate with myself as well, as it relates to forced course of treatment. Having you know um, someone that maybe has gone through these things, and also understanding the research and what goes into when somebody is actually ready for treatment. And that's why I asked many times during seconds if anyone here knows those things, knows that you can, 
what's the saying? You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Unfortunately, that's what happens with, with, this, with this disease, with substance use disorder, is that you can set up all the things in place for somebody to get services, but until they're ready to accept and internalize, you're not going to see the, the success that you think you would by forcing them to be there. I do believe that substance use disorder treatment should be available to those that find themselves involved in the criminal justice system and that need that treatment. Those are some of the things that I do appreciate about this bill is that it does provide treatment options if you are charged with possession. But there are many number of people who aren't necessarily charged with possession but have significant substance use disorder issues. My concern is that we will continue to see people cycle in and out. And unfortunately, I think what we're trying to do, and I think there is well intention as far as trying to save lives, which I am all for. How do we save lives? I don't know that this is the way. Fentanyl is a public health crisis and I believe we should be addressing it in the same manner as a public health issue, not punitively. And for that reason, that, that is what gives me pause in supporting the felonization provision of this policy. I do appreciate all of the good parts in this bill around harm reduction, around options for treatment. But I cannot support the felonization, nor can I support the forced treatment when we know that it has been already difficult for people who are wanting to access voluntary treatment that is difficult for them to access that currently. I also appreciate some of the amendments that were brought forward during second reading. And I'm hopeful to see the ongoing conversations that will happen, knowing that we are in the first chamber. And I'm also happy to continue engaging in conversations. Thank you. Representative Judah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I think we know that we as, as legislators have a responsi responsibility to stop people from dying from fentanyl. And at the end of the day, that is what this bill, that is what, that's what is at the center of this bill. And I'm very grateful to the bill sponsors um, for not compromising on that. What we do know is people are still dealing fentanyl. And what we do know is that people are unknowingly being poisoned by fentanyl. There are components of this bill that will be effective to address fentanyl in Colorado, like being tough on distribution, public education, and allowing, allocating money to harm reduction and treatment. However, I do feel it is important to go on the record and say that I do not believe the solution is to felonize drugs. Going down this path has failed before and we need to learn from our mistakes. There is a concern who will be arrested for this and we owe our neighbors to not abuse this felony charge. We know who will be disproportionately affected by this bill. This continues to be a huge issue for me and as a result is giving me pause. There were, harm, there were helpful amendments, there were helpful amendments brought on the floor that I'm hoping will continue to push this bill in the right direction. And I know this bill will be back in this chamber giving me a chance to evaluate any changes and reevaluate my vote. So I will be a yes today but there is work to do, and I trust we will get there. Representative Larson. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so members, first off, I want to start by commending both bill sponsors this is an incredibly difficult subject. And I think for once in this room, I think everybody is in agreement that there's a problem. And I think there are legitimate non-political reasons why we are on different sides of this. And I think there's gonna be a lot of yes and a lot of no votes on both sides of the aisle for very different reasons. Um, <clears throat> I start back, when this bill was being heard in the Judiciary Committee, I ran into one of the members of the committee in the hall and made a sort of flip remark that this would be the most consequential thing that we do probably in the four years that I've been down here if we get it right. And I still think that that statement uh, made as quickly as it was it's probably true. Um, I have a lot of concerns with what's in this bill, and they're very different from the concerns that we've heard thus far. Uh, and I just want everyone in this building and everyone indeed in the state to know that I am down here not because I want to punish individual users of drugs. I don't think that there's anybody in this room that wants to put somebody suffering from addiction on the streets in jail for out of some sort of you know vengeance or some kind of you know denigration of their character i am up here and my objections are because i want to save as many lives as possible and i don't think what we've been doing is working for the last three years i've watched the city that i've spent almost my entire life living in start to die and wither on the vine. I have watched children, parents, people living on the street a block north of here. We could all go out, members, you've all seen it. A block north of here, there are dozens of people with needles in their arms right now. We've seen those needles in their arms. People in this chamber have had needles thrown at them when walking through these things. And this is blocks from the Capitol. This is sad. This is a crisis. And this is unlike anything we've ever seen. Unlike every other drug crisis that we have seen, fentanyl is so deadly and so different. For the first time, we are dealing with a drug that is not just potentially lethal to the people that are putting it in their bodies, but is lethal to a bystander who walks by. It is such a small amount you hear stories about people going into overdose because of trying to perform CPR and resuscitation. You hear stories of children and infants that are in a household that are exposed to such a small amount that they go into overdose. This is an entirely different level of threat from the other drugs that we have dealt with. And indeed, I don't think that putting people who are using these drugs in a personal way in jail is going to be the best thing. And indeed, I think if this bill were in a position that I would have preferred to see it in with a zero, a zero, zero policy, I don't think a lot of users would have ended up in jail. And I know there are disagreements about that, but it is my sincere belief that our criminal justice system and our DAs and our law enforcement recognize that that's not the most effective way to get somebody who needs help the help that they need. And I wouldn't support it if I thought that's all it was going to do. But I don't think that that's what it's going to do. And I think what we have seen over the last three years, what we are seeing in our streets, what our law enforcement community is saying in a single unified voice to us, that this is out of control and that these are the tools that they need to get a handle on what is going on. I think we have to look outside this building and say what we are doing now is not working. People are dying and we need to try something else. And it needs to be drastic. As much as I wish that harm reduction alone and that drug intervention alone worked, it doesn't because there is no magic wand that solves this problem. If we'd had it, we would have done it before I was born. But members, the bill before us today does not go far enough. The thing that I am most concerned about 
Setting aside the possession issue, which again, like I said, I'm on the record, needs to go down to zero. But the provision I'm most concerned about is that under this law, a dealer could distribute a drug, somebody could die, and when that dealer is charged with possession, they could get off with probation. A dealer can kill somebody and be walking the streets, go through the full judicial process and be back out on the streets, not be in jail, not be off the streets. And we're not talking about a simple user, we're talking about somebody arrested for dealing. That's tone deaf. It's totally unacceptable. And I cannot support a bill moving forward that allows for that. I hope that this bill comes back to us from the Senate with fixes that will put it in a place where I can support it. Because again, every day that we don't have action on this, lives are lost. And that is not hyperbole. There's a lot of that that goes on in this room. This is not one of those things. There will be people dying every single day until something is done. And we need to make sure that we get this right. And this is a tough vote. And I know there are a lot of people with earnest beliefs that that is the wrong way to go. And I have to, I'm standing on the other side of that, and I don't know how we communicate across that gap. But members, I will be a no vote today. And unless the Senate is able to fix this and make this, give it some more teeth to where we can stop what's happening on our streets, I cannot support this bill. I hope to be back down here reversing myself in a few weeks where we've got a better bill here, but I cannot support it in this current form. Representative Molka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to come up and, and start off by talking about Karina Rodriguez. Karina Rodriguez passed away on February 20th. She was one of five individuals uh, in Commerce City. And I sat in that back corner with Karina's sister. Because I wanted to learn about her. I wanted to know who she was. Felice is a, a constituent and reached out. And she wanted to tell me what her sister meant to her that she was her best friend, that she was a baby of the family, and what she meant to her family. But most of all, she wanted to talk to me about Karina as a mother. She talked to me about how much that she loved being a mom to Jojo and Aria and how her little girl lit up her life. She wanted to talk to me about how when she went over to, to gather Aria's things, how, how every little piece of clothing was folded perfectly and how that little girl meant everything to Karina. She wanted to talk to me about how they were going to explain this to her and, and how Jojo doesn't really understand what's going on right now and, and how they were going to explain the news articles that were coming out and how that painted their mom. That because, just because she died from an overdose doesn't, didn't make her a bad mom. And that just because articles were being written like that, that that didn't mean that she was a bad mom and they were trying to figure out how they were going to explain that to her. Members, this poison has ravaged my community. I was sitting there with Felice and I didn't realize there was this connection that Felice went to the same high school that I did and that she knew my sister-in-law 
and she was talking to me about knowing Jackie and that she was actually, she actually dated Jackie's husband before Jackie and Sean got together and that Jackie had Felice over for a sleepover when they broke up and, and, and it reminded me that in my community, our roots run deep. That when one of us feels a loss, we all feel that loss. Members, my community has seen a 50% increase in overdose deaths, overdose deaths. My city has seen those deaths double. Doing nothing is not an option. And I respect the sponsor, I respect Representative Lynch because he said, he said that this is not a silver bullet. This will not solve everything. We have so much more work to do. But doing nothing is not an option. And I wanna give credit to Representative Bacon and Representative Benavidez because you made this bill better. We got more resources in this bill for treatment. And there's, there's bills outside of just the punitive that are gonna do amazing things that are gonna save lives. The naloxone, the test strips, there are things that are going to save lives. And we don't have an option to stand idly by and doing nothing while people in our community are dying. Because what I realized in talking to Felice is the hole that that put in her heart, and not just in her heart, in her whole family's heart. And then you multiply that and you multiply that with all of the families that now have that hole in their heart. And that doesn't heal. That doesn't heal. That little girl will not now have a mother. That little boy doesn't have a mother. And so I'm up here, and I will be a yes today, because that's what my community's asked me to do because they told me that doing nothing is not an option. And don't make no mistake of it, we have more work to do, and I look forward to continuing to work on it. But today, this bill needs to be passed. We need to move it on through the system so that we, we can make real change and we can start passing policy and getting policy into place that's going to save lives. Thank you for your time, members. Representative Curver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, the um, hours and hours of testimony that we had in judiciary from uh, the grieving family members, um, their terrible loss, uh, their search for justice, their search for a more effective response uh, that we must have in Colorado. Um, with the death toll ever increasing, especially in the last two to three years. It will go higher, members. It will go higher this year and next year unless we have a strong change in our laws to address the fentanyl crisis. My concerns with the current felony possession provision is that it is not effective. It is not an effective, it's, it's a placeholder, but it's not effective. Law enforcement can't use it. We can't use it to actually get people into treatment and get them diverted. It will not be a, an effective provision. I regret we were not able to improve the bill on Friday. This bill does not meet the challenge of our fentanyl crisis. This bill as it's written today is not strong enough. It will not turn the corner members on the tsunami of death heading our way. And that is why 
I have to be a no on this, Bill. As Rep. Larson stated, I am hopeful that if it comes back to the House, I hope stronger, I hope more effective on possession. I also simply cannot countenance a sentencing structure for distribution of fentanyl or fentanyl analogs of four grams or less, which is a heck of a lot of fentanyl or fentanyl analog, that causes death and the person is probation eligible. That is simply wrong. Go talk to any of those grieving family members. I will tell you, the grieving family members that came and testified in judiciary, the distribution that killed their family member was less than four grams. Their child is just as dead. And we, from a policy standpoint, are going to say that probation is a possible sentencing option, and that is justice? I don't think so, members. Let's hope we get a stronger bill coming out of the Senate. I would love to be able to vote yes on a bill that I thought would actually meet the kind of challenge we are facing in this state from fentanyl. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. An honor to serve with you, too, Representative Lynch. So I'm new at this game, but I think rarely in our careers, members, are we faced with a bill that has had so much bipartisan work on it, so much stakeholding. Why? Because our citizens are dying, dying, not having a little bit of an issue here and there. How can we fix them up? How can we help them out? People are just dying. Now, my history is I was in the dying business. I was in the military. My job was to make sure that happened to the bad guys. But I sure as hell never thought that in public service to my state, we would have such a hard time knuckling up and realizing we have an opportunity right now to make a difference. If this bill doesn't move forward, how can you go back to your constituents the next time a kid dies and say, whoop, we couldn't get over it. We all went to our political corners. We didn't fix this thing. Members, this is a, this is a must pass bill. It'll continue to get work on it. But if we don't do our job today, shame on you. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you, members, for all really digging into this bill. You all know I have my opinions on felonizing possession and criminal justice reform. But what I've learned through this conversation is that many of us in this room and many of folks in the gallery actually share a lot of common goals. We want to save lives and we want to help people suffering from addiction. We've been talking about how to respond to drug use and addiction for decades. As a society, we have made our missteps. And those missteps have had disastrous consequences for our communities, especially communities of color. Fentanyl is scary. It's terrifying. And in its purest form, it is deadly. But fentanyl in its purest form is rarely, if ever, 
found on the streets. It is exceedingly unlikely that anyone except an illegal drug manufacturer or dist distributor would possess four or more grams of pure fentanyl or any amount of pure fentanyl. Even in counterfeit pills, the copied drug and inactive ingredients comprise most of the pill's weight. We know that. Addicts suffering from substance use disorders simply do not possess fentanyls in the, in the, quality, sorry, the quantities that critics suggest. In the contrary, many folks who are dealing with addiction possess trace amounts of fentanyl mixed with other drugs. That is the nefarious nature of this deadly drug. Fentanyl in our streets is not sold in pure form, but mixed in cocaine, heroin, meth, and counterfeit prescription pills. But I want to be clear that fentanyl is not an anomaly in the continuing story of drug use, addiction, and death. It is one part of the story. And how we choose to respond today will determine the outcome. I want to dispel a myth that has been reiterated about the 19 bill over and over and over again. The work that Representative Sandrich and I did did not legalize the possession of illegal drugs. The four-gram amendment was not even debated by this body because it was added in the Senate as a compromise between law enforcement and criminal justice reformers. That needs to be made clear. Additionally, it did not make possession of fentanyl a small misdemeanor only punishable by a ticket, as the Gazette might say. In fact, it allowed for up to 18 months of jail time on your first offense. People need to enforce the law. Why did our bill get bipartisan support? It's because we know, and this body agreed with bipartisan Democrats and Republicans, that the war on drugs is an abject failure. For too long, we have let fear guide our policy making, fear lead the government to declare this war on drugs. But the war on drugs has failed. It has devastated our communities. It has ruined lives. And it has turned the nation of liberty and freedom into one of the most carceral countries in the world. And it didn't even work. The war on drugs did not end drug use or addiction. It didn't get drugs off our streets. And it didn't deter dealers. Since the war on drugs began, the US has the, the incarceration rate in the US has grown by more than 500%. Drug offenses are the leading cause of arrest, with nearly 1.2 million drug arrests each year. Over 85% of these arrests are for simple possession and people in communities of color have been disproportionately impacted. And yet, the overdose and fatality rate has continued to cr climb for over 40 years. And the devastation was intentional. As my friend Representative Sanders reminds me, the f in fact, it was John Erkman of the Nixon administration who said, you want to know what the war on drugs is really about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? Quote, we knew that we couldn't make it illegal to either be against the war or against blacks. But by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, then criminalization both heavily, we can disrupt those communities. We can arrest their leaders, we can raid their homes, we can break up their meetings, we can vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the war on drugs? Yep, of course we did. That is a fact. I would argue that the rhetoric around this bill, especially right here in Denver, follows the same pattern. But instead, the target is our unhoused neighbors who are dealing with addiction. When we introduced this bill, we, and it, we did so to address a real problem in our communities and to save lives. People are dying from fentanyl poisonings. They are overdosing, many because they are unknowingly taking a lethal dose of this drug. So how do we stem this tide? If we know the war on drugs isn't working, what does? 
First, we must ensure that we don't go back to failed policies of the past, and we must listen to the experts. We must have more treatment and harm reduction in this state today. We are one of the worst in the nation of providing substance misuse services to those who need it, both incarcerated and not incarcerated. Decades of research shows us that public health approach is in fact the most effective way to reduce drug use. Harm reduction works. In fact, jurisdictions that implement harm reduction have su successfully and significantly reduced overdose deaths, they have stopped the spread of infectious diseases, and even the non-medical use of these drugs. They have proven success in other cities, and we know that MAT works too. This bill provides millions of dollars in harm reduction and treatment. That, coupled with the work of the Behavioral Health Task Force from this body, will prove to be the state's largest investment in behavioral health that we have ever seen. Additionally, this bill addresses something that we know. When someone dies of overdose, either poisoning or otherwise, they are more likely to survive if a friend or a family member calls 911 and helps them until they get help. These people should not become felons. They need to stay on the scene and they need to help their friend. This will save lives. And the Good Samaritan provisions in this bill will save lives. That's why the public health aspects of this bill are so important. Ensuring that people have access to naloxone so they can keep their loved one alive. Ensuring people have access to testing strips and treatment. That's what we know works. I want to tell you about my friend Brandon. Sorry, Bruce. He came to me because his partner, Luis, died of a fentanyl overdose. There was not treatment, and there was not enough Narcan to save him. He asked for a bill that would address this issue, but that it would also get help to the community that he knows is active users who needs this help. The harm reduction provisions in this bill will not bring Luis back, but will help to ensure that there's not more Luises, that we can save lives. Additionally, this bill ensures punishment for high-level dealers and dis distributors of this deadly drug. I want to be clear, this bill does increase penalties for those dealers who are poisoning people. One Let's minute. not forget that. One thank minute, you, Mr. Minute. Speaker. And I want to thank the speaker for listening to the community. I want to thank Representative Lynch for listening to the community. This is not a perfect bill. One gram for simple possession does not address the concerns that we're having today. Someone who is poisoned, who survives a poisoning, should not leave the hospital and be brought to the Department of Corrections. Their dealers need to face consequences, and if they have an addiction issue, they need treatment. But I must admit that doing nothing is not an answer either. We have to move something forward today. But I believe, I believe, we additionally need to work on these possession provisions to ensure that folks who survive an unintentional overdose actually have access to treatment and not jail. Your 10 minutes is up, Representative Heard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the work that you've done on this bill. This is not my last vote on this bill. This is not our last vote on this bill. We have a lot more work to do, and I'm committed to doing that work with you. Thank you. Representative A. Valdez and then Representative Holtor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you. Uh, this has been quite a debate uh, here, uh, probably the greatest one I've seen, the biggest one I've seen. I want to start by saying that I represent Ground Zero. I represent downtown Denver. I represent the so-called Costco of drugs. I spent all weekend thinking how I would respond to this debate, 
And trust me, the irony doesn't escape me that at this time last year, same day, we were debating another bill about another dangerous drug. Now, I stand here with only the option of voting for a bill that is permissive of one gram of poison. I don't agree with that, and I would challenge the worldview that most people of Colorado agree that it's okay to possess one gram of hard drugs under any circumstance. Do you believe there's a good cause to possess fentanyl, meth, crystal meth, crack, you name it? Is there any reason that we should be saying that it's okay to possess those things? I don't know a single parent, sibling, or anyone else that would say that that is something that our constituents agree with. The, the argument about fentanyl being tested in, in marijuana and things like that, it's, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous argument. I've heard that police can already arrest on a misdemeanor. Can you imagine the hell that would rain down if police started arresting for misdemeanors in this building? Now you're getting arrested for other things have nothing to do with drugs. I don't say this as a representative of El Paso or Douglas or Larimer or Pueblo, any other place. I say it as a representative downtown. The Costco of drugs. It's cheap. Some, because of some of the policies that have been passed in this building, the price of drugs has dropped dramatically in Denver. It's no coincidence that the metrics on synthetic opioids killing people are tracking about the same amount straight to the roof. You know, a year or two ago, it was in an alley. Drug deals always happen downtown. That's nothing new. But today, I see people smoking fentanyl on the patio at Tarantulas over on 15th and Stout. All day, every day. Just walk over there. They're smoking right now. I can tell you what it smells like. I can differentiate meth smoke and fentanyl smoke because I walk through it all the time. I support zero because it's black and brown people that are dying from fentanyl and other drug overdoses. To me, it's about involuntary. Who voluntarily starts smoking fentanyl? You're outside of yourself to make that choice. It can kill you. It can kill you in one try. It's about giving the system, society, our government, the ability to intervene to save lives. I saw my first dead body two weeks ago. Arms up. Terrible. I've lived downtown almost 20 years. Never seen a dead body. Right next to a lighter, a pipe, and a foil. Dead of fentanyl. It was horrible. What's more horrifying is that this is just the first of the synthetic opioids, the synthetic drugs that are coming. There's already synthetic meth out there. You want to see what that does to folks? It's scary. I want it stopped. My constituents want it stopped. I represent a city that has great diversion program. They're ready. We've invested. Denver is ready to take people off the street and get them to a chance to survive. I support that. I'm also the kind of person as a leader that believes when your city, everybody who matters in your city tells you something, you do it. You, in, you enable them with the tools. The mayor of Denver, the police chief of Denver, almost every RNO supports zero. So don't make this about Denver not liking it, because they do. If not just one person stands up and says that we have a problem with a gram of poison, but everybody does it, should we listen? I know that the families of those who died, I know that my parents would prefer that I entered the system rather than show up as a dead body laying on 14th in Curtis in a sleeping bag in rigor mortis. I'm going to vote yes today because it's a start. But I like so many hope that we get a better bill back because this is a tool that we're being asked to do. I shouldn't, I mean, it's weird that I was kind of one of the only folks that stood up for zero because at the end of the day, that's the tool that my city wants me to give them so they can divert. 
into our amazing program, which us taxpayers, we the taxpayers of Denver, have invested in greatly. So I'm gonna vote yes today, a reluctant yes. I'm gonna hope that a better bill comes back. I believe the bill right now falls short by one gram. I'm gonna do this because I believe rehab and even jail is better than being dead. It's way better than being dead. I do that knowing that the bodies in the morgue, dead of fentanyl, are black and brown. The people that get robbed to pay for them in my district who have their cars stolen, they're black and brown too. I know how fentanyl is paid for, which is why I can support zero. It's not the first crime. It's an ultimate crime and it's terrible, but at the end of the day, the drug use is not the big crime. The crime is how somebody gets there, how society failed them. We know this stuff is poison. We know that this gives some tools. They're good tools. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna do this because I know that some lives will be saved and maybe I'll have less of a chance of walking by a dead body in my neighborhood. I do this knowing that I have the support of my community and I do this in the memory of the millions and millions of people who are likely to die of synthetic opioids. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, esteemed colleagues. I stand here before you in full support of the words spoken by my colleague from Denver, who is at ground zero. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the speaker, and I'd like to thank Representative Lynch because they are working on the most important bill, I believe, that will be heard in this chamber, and working through a incredible myriad of challenges, listening to everybody and trying to find, walking on a razor's edge, trying to find a pathway to change the trajectory of what is fentanyl. Of course it's a dangerous drug, it's even more dangerous now that the cartel down south of the Rio is cooking this stuff in makeshift labs. And believe me, there's no quality control down there. I've lived down there. <clears throat> I've been to Caro Quintero's hometown. Go back in the 80s if you wanna know what went on then. It's the same game. It's the same game, just the drugs are getting more potent more dangerous and more lethal. So this weekend I spoke with a constituent about this bill. This particular person grew up homeless in the streets of Kansas City because his mother abandoned him at age 12. I will tell you this person has seen it all. He has seen it all and I've heard the stories because I'm quite close to this person as we've grown in our relationship. And here's what this individual told me. He said if it wouldn't have been for his incarceration, he would be dead. If it wouldn't have been, let me repeat that. If it wouldn't have been for his incarceration, he would be dead. He would have died on the streets living that life. So I would argue before everybody today that that incarceration saved his life and he admits it himself. You see, you've got to hit rock bottom or you have to have somebody intervene and interrupt this journey down the dark tunnel to the abyss. But here's the problem with fentanyl, ladies and gentlemen. You don't even get to take that journey now. Because the Grim Reaper swoops in and takes you. Now the problem is different today than it was back in the last decade. And how does Representative know anything about that? Representative Holtorf, how do you know anything about that? 
Well, I don't know as much as my colleague from Denver, Representative Valdez, I know that because he lives at ground zero. But here's what I do know. Back then, the fentanyl was being distributed and produced in a place where there actually was a little bit of quality control. In fact, some of it was being diverted from pharmaceuticals. It actually, some of it had FDA licensure. But now, fentanyl is coming in from the south. Fast. As fast as the mules can deliver it. I'll tell you something else about this story. I've talked to mules in su idioma, de su país. Because I have a way of talking with people and I get to know people. And after a while, they actually tell me things they probably shouldn't tell me. But I will tell you, a mule can have any drug that's in Dr. Field's Goods toolbox from south of the border to Phoenix, Arizona in less than 12 hours. And they get paid pretty well to do it. Now, it comes with incredible risk. Well, less risk now. The borders are wide open, or near wide open. But many of them are willing to do it because they do have a life of poverty. And the payout is grand. This fellow that I spoke to said, you know, I did that trip three times. And then I'd had enough. I'd taken that risk enough. I figured my luck was going to run out. But he would tell me, you know, we're just delivering what your society wants. The hard drugs. So it's not my sin. <clears throat> now, I had a hard time with that. And I tried to debate the individual. But <clears throat> like many things, the debate was circular and got nowhere. But I will tell you, this drug doesn't let people hit rock bottom. And how many of you have children or grandchildren? Because that little blue pill, or whatever drug they're taking, is now laced with the most corrosive fentanyl ever produced in the history of mankind. Let's be honest. This isn't the stuff that you got from when I got bucked off that horse and they gave me all those painkillers. When I got home, I threw them in the toilet and flushed them because I didn't want that problem because I'd heard about it. But this isn't that. This is something else. This isn't made in a pharmaceutical lab, and it's not being distributed that way. And people can't hit rock bottom. I'm going to be a yes today, but I, like my colleague from Denver, you know, there is no rural-urban divide here. I think we have to say no mas. In this case, no mas and go to zero. But if this is the compromise today, I'm a yes to move this forward. On behalf of the speaker and the bill sponsor, thank you very much for working this very difficult issue. Thank you, Representative Holtworth. Madam Speaker, pro tem Benavides. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and members, this is one of the most complex issues that we'll face this year. And I really want to thank the sponsors for their work on this. They did try to hear all voices, and I think that's important. But this bill, you know, it's, it's a policy matter that both sides of the aisle um, put forward as one of their policy pillars this year, and that was criminal justice. And this is an important part of that. And the bill does a lot of good things. Um, it does a lot around harm reduction, um, medication-assisted treatment. We put more money into investigating deaths from fentanyl. Those are just some of the things that it does. And it also really strengthens the penalties around distribution. And even the penalties around distribution, including death. And you know, we heard from so many families um, who lost someone. And most of them talked to us about buying a pill that 
they were not buying fentanyl in their minds. They were buying an Oxy or they were buying a Percocet. You know, that's the reason about distribution. When you have something where right now pretty much all drugs have some fentanyl in it, and, and this, I know, is the problem between lowering it from four grams and that's why this is such an important debate and so important to hear all the voices in that. And at least for me, the amount with regard to deaths, because I know uh, I truly respect my colleague from Colorado Springs that brought this up, you know, that some may be uh, entitled to probation. But, you know, distribution is not just the guy with wads of money standing on the street selling drugs. It can be a high school kid sharing some drugs that they didn't know what was in it. It could be a college kid. And yes, somebody can die with one pill. And that's what could happen to that person by adding death to their sentence. So I really do think even those changes with regard to distribution are important compromises. But what we struggled with the most on this bill was how do we address possession. Fentanyl has become the predominant drug in our society and it has really upended how we should think and how should we should act about drugs. And, and we're not the only legislature in this country struggling with this. And I don't know that any of us have the right answer. Um, so whether it's a, a misdemeanor is under four grams or over one gram or zero grams, I'm not gonna say anyone who was a proponent of any of those was wrong. We just don't know. And for me, the one gram was a compromise. And you know, I, I disagree with one of my colleagues from Denver, because we heard from two other Denver legislators at least, or three, that talked about that issue. So no city has unanimity on how we address this. And my colleague um, uh, from Thornton also talked about how we struggle with this in our community. So it's not just Denver. Every community is struggling with this, either openly or where we don't know what's going on in high schools and colleges behind closed doors. We don't know that, and particularly when you can buy some of this online. But by making it one gram, I recognize that some individuals may be pulled into felonization that shouldn't be there. But I think some of the amendments that we put on these, this bill to act as guardrails around that will be important. We put in the necessity to show that the person had a reasonable cause to believe that what they had was fentanyl. And I know prosecutors think that that stops it. I don't. I think it makes it more difficult, and I think it should be more difficult. But I don't think it stops it from being prosecuted. But even once someone is in jail, we put some guardrails around that. We ask that their sentences be served in jails, not going directly to prison. We ask that they get some treatment in jail, that they get work release, that they get release from treatment to go, for treatment from jail. We put all of those things in there to make it easier. We put uh, amendments with regard to expungement of their records. We put um, more diversion information in there, and we're gonna have another bill that'll put more money towards diversion in those areas. But I know this won't be enough, and it's not enough to satisfy probably either side. But as policymakers, I think that we need to try to evaluate what we hear from all sides. And then we have to weigh what we can do and what we can pass. This is far from a perfect bill. 
it is a compromise. And it might not be the best compromise. And I know it will not be the final act of this legislature on fentanyl. In fact, we put a repeal in there so we can take another look at it. There's also po a post-enactment review so that we will get this body, will get another opportunity to say if this works. Um, it's not the best answer in the world, but it's the one that we can do now that we have to do. We have to do something. We have to respond to our communities. So I urge a yes vote on this bill. Minority Leader McKean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, it truly is an honor to serve here with you. Honor to serve with you too, Minority Leader McKean. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your work. Representative Lynch, thank you for all your work. And, and truly, I, th I think all of us have had a hand in talking to people about this issue and wrestling with what the right answer is. We heard a few things up here that I think, I think that we really kind of have to take apart a little bit. And, and I, I sat there and thought, do I want to come up and say anything or, or do we want to just kind of let things stand? And I, I think it's harmful if we let them stand. This drug does not discriminate. This drug does not discriminate against a 16-year-old girl who died at her desk after getting a pill from a friend. It does not discriminate between five kids in Commerce City who died so fast they couldn't dial 911. It doesn't discriminate from the person you had to walk past, Representative Valdez. This drug doesn't care. It has no regard for color or status or income. It is death. I think that's the first piece of this that we have to wrestle with. The second piece is that there are some who because of an addiction need treatment. I'm glad that this bill has a lot in it for treatment. But I'm constantly reminded in the stories that I read and that I hear that this drug is touching the lives of people who are not addicted to it in greater and greater numbers. That it is touching lives of people who, who just got a pill they thought was something else or wanted to party with their friends. They're not addicted to it. And so then I, I look at the treatment piece of this as, as something that, that, that's there, good for the people it's there for, but nothing there for, for others. And then I try to make up my mind of what we're trying to accomplish. I want this drug off our streets. I don't want to learn to live with it. I don't want to figure this out. I want this drug off my streets. Saturday night was prom night. And after pictures and saying goodbye to the kids, there were six kids. And I made them stop and I said, don't take anything. Don't accept anything. Don't accept a drink that somebody else has opened. Don't take anything. Don't trust anything. And later that night, I waited to hear the garage door go up. Because that's the only way I know they're home safe. Folks, this is what families across the state are experiencing right now. And it's not just downtown Denver. It's Haxton. It's Haxton, for God's sake. Where just about the worst freaking thing you could worry about was whether or not somebody had a 12-pack instead of a six-pack. Nope, not now. Rep. Roberts, you know this. You see it every day in your community. As a prosecutor, you see the prevalence, the penetration of this drug into our world. It's worse than anything we've ever seen. There's a reason why we are here debating this drug. Say nothing about my concerns with 
the 2019 bill. Nothing about my concerns with not hearing the repeal bill in 2020. Yeah, I thought it was a bad idea. Called it out. There's a reason we're talking about this drug. The worry I have, the worry I've had all along, is that the parents we heard from were never given the chance to say, kiddo, I want to make sure we get you into treatment. Those parents were never given the chance to say, son, I think you're on a bad path. The parents we heard from found their kids dead. They found their kids cold. And pale. And they tried to revive them. And they desperately, desperately wanted it all to be taken back. And in the end, they had to call the police and the police the coroner. And they had to sit through the longest day that they will ever spend. As people came into their homes and put their kids on a stretcher and took them away for the last time. That's what this drug means. That's what this debate means. Thank you for your work on this. This is important. Representative Bockenfeld, Mr. Speaker. You can go after me. No. All right. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem and uh, members. Thank you for your attention uh, today, Friday, and all session. I'm tired. This is a very, very challenging issue. You can hear from people on both sides of the aisle that they don't think that this is a perfect bill. And I <clears throat> understand why you're saying that. It's primarily based on, not solely, but it's primarily based on this question of possession. And what I will say is that It's an important discussion for us to be having in 1326, but 1326 is much more than possession. This is a strong, collaborative, comprehensive, and thoughtful approach to the fentanyl crisis. And it comes at it from both sides. I wish this was the perfect bill. I wish we had a billion dollars to put towards voluntary treatment. I wish that we could change the world in one stroke of a pen with one subject title, with one bill number. I wish that we hadn't relied on a system that wasn't investing in mental and behavioral health for the last 20 years. But that's where we are. And when we enter in this conversation about possession, you get essentially both sides saying it has to be my way or it has to be my way, and I am telling you, at this moment, at this time, with how deadly fentanyl is, it cannot be one or the other. We have to go right down the middle of this aisle because this crisis is killing people every single day. So I'm gonna talk about what's in the bill because there's a lot in here that's gonna save lives and no one talks about it. This bill expands the number of organizations that can get opioid antagonists. Naloxone saves lives. This bill, because of the ask of law enforcement, protects persons who administer opioid antagonists from civil liability. This will encourage the use of naloxone and detection tests, and that will save lives. This bill allocates $20 million to buy opioid antagonists to be distributed around the state. This will save lives. This bill allocates CDPHE $300,000 to purchase synthetic opioid testing strips and will provide them to more eligible entities across the state. Because 
That will save lives when people are educated and know what is in their drugs. We are not going to stop recreational drug use in this building. We're not going to do it. So we have to make sure that we arm and we prepare and we educate Coloradans to better understand the crisis that we know too well. And one way of doing that is establishing the ongoing statewide prevention and education campaign to inform the public about fentanyl. We have done that in this state before. We did it with methamphetamine between 2006 and 2010, and that saved lives. And now we can do the same. We know that that works, and that is in this bill. There's also a community education grant program to make sure that it's not just the statewide campaign, that community organizations have the resources to educate their communities because we know it's not just in Denver, it's touching every single part of this state to make sure that their communities understand the deadliness of fentanyl. It's gonna expand the current harm reduction grant program to allow for more resources to be extended to law enforcement, community mental health centers, local public health agencies, and other local diversion efforts to help keep people out of jail, to move them into recovery, and that is going to save lives. It allocates six million additional dollars to harm reduction grants. This will save lives. It will expand MAT to require that MAT jails or recipients rec receive doses of MAT upon release and receive referral for continued medication. That will save lives. This bill allocates three million more dollars to jails to increase MAT for people who are in custody. And let me just take a moment and thank Representative Herod, Representative Lynch, Representative Sanders, all of those who have come together on this piece of legislation to better inform this bill as it's made its way through the process because there are realities on the ground that are reflected in the bill that's before us. Now, we can't just go to the harm reduction side to save lives because Colorado statutes are not prepared for the fentanyl crisis. The cut points that are in law right now for possession with intent to distribute do not reflect the deadliness of fentanyl. From zero to 14 grams is a DF3. 14 grams, that's 140 pills, that's too much fentanyl. For the DF2, it's 14 grams to 225 grams, that's half a pound of fentanyl, that's too much fentanyl. And anything over that is the DF1. This bill realigns those cut points. That's the most important issue that I've been working with district attorneys across this state on because they need to make sure that they can charge the dealers who are profiting off of the poison, that they can make sure that they can charge them with higher classes of penalties, with higher penalties, and this bill does that. Right now, in Colorado statute, you have reckless endangerment and you have extreme indifference. That is the two ends of the spectrum for the families who came to testify, who I've met with, whose hands I've shook, who every time I hear their stories I choke up, thinking of my own kids. This bill puts in place a drug felony one for distribution leading to death. Because right now there is no tool to go after the people who are killing Coloradans, that are killing kids, and they're destroying families. And that tool is in this bill along with an amendment that we put on the floor to make sure there's an investigation fund established so that there are resources that go to breaking up high-level cartel activity and to investigate the deaths of these kiddos so no family comes to this legislature ever again to say there weren't the resources, no one followed up, we have the text messages, no one heard us. That is in this bill. We know that Fentanyl is coming across our borders, coming into the state. This bill increases the penalty for importation of fentanyl. This bill is very serious when it comes to importing any amount of fentanyl, and that is going to save lives. We also know that the deadly mixture that's being created in the blue pills, where too much fentanyl is being, being pressed into the pills, is leading to some of the overdoses on, on in, the, in the fact that one pill can kill. This bill increases the penalty if you have a pill press and you are making these deadly pills in your basement, in your residence, wherever you may be, 
because we take that seriously. We need to make sure that we are holding these dealers of poison accountable for the lives that they are taking here in Colorado. This bill is balanced. I know we are stuck on this possession piece. And with all due respect to each one of you, not one of you introduced a possession bill and brought it up to my desk to introduce. So you can beat me up as much as you want. You can say, one is, one is, you know, not, one is too high. It needs to be zero. Well, okay. We're trying to get a comprehensive bill across the finish line to help save lives. That, in my opinion, is not a silver bullet. Whether or not it's one or it's zero is not going to save exponentially more lives or it would have been in the title of the bill and it would have been the only thing in the bill that we introduced. But guess what? It wasn't even in the bill that we introduced because the people that want to save lives came to me and asked for all these other tools that I just outlined for you. And I understand where we are. I understand how this process works. I know that maybe we had to dig into this conversation. And let me tell you, dig in. I sure did. For three weeks, I have spent just obsessing about possession, trying to get it right, trying not to ruin anyone's life, trying to not make sure that a felony is hanging over someone's head as they try to move forward with school and jobs and the rest of their life, but making sure that we get these pills off the streets. Mr. And Speaker, you have uh, 52 seconds left. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. And that compromise of one will get pills off the street. Thank you to all the members that have worked so hard making sure that that felony is not DOC eligible, making sure that the records are sealed, making sure that it's the most compassionate way that we can approach this we possibly can. Thank you to all of you. This is a compromise. We have to get this bill passed. The last thing I will say, the greatest failure of all is the failure to act when action is needed and action is desperately needed. I know it's not perfect, but please support House Bill 1326. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1326. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? No. Representative Gray votes no. Please close the machine. With 43 aye votes, 22 no votes, and zero excuse, House Bill 1326 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Majority Leader Escar. We're going to finish the House Oh, Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1281. House Bill 1281 by Representatives Gonzalez Gutierrez and Rex, also Senators Winter and Rankin, concerning a program to fund behavioral health care services and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1281 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1281 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Rep Rep Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Sorry, no. No problem. Representative Hanks votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes.
please close the machine. With 46 I votes, 19 no votes, and zero excuse, House Bill 1281 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1287. House Bill 1287 by Representatives Basenecker and Hooten, also Senator Winter, concerning protections for mobile home park residents and in connection with making an appropriation. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1287 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1287 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? No. Representative Hanks votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please close the machine. With 41 aye votes, 24 no votes, and zero excuse, House Bill 1287 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Gray, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Majority Leader Eskar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay over the balance of the third reading calendar until tomorrow, April 26th. See no objection. The balance of the, the third reading calendar will be laid over until Tuesday, April 26th. Majority Leader Eskar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay over the balance of the calendar until tomorrow, April 26th. See no objection. The balance of the calendar will be laid over until Tuesday, April 26th. Representative Perry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, we will have uh, Appropriations Committee tomorrow morning at uh, 8 a.m. Madam Vice Chair, yep, 8 a.m. Uh, I'll see you there. And thanks to all of our wonderful staff who's been working so hard to get our appropriations calendars going. Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The State Affairs Committee will start at 2.20. That's 10 minutes from now. Please hurry over. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, for all the friends of finance, we will also be meeting at 2.20. So um, as soon as we are finished here, please make your way to committee room 112. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, same tune, 2.20 for ag, livestock, and water. See you then. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, we have the Capital Commission in the basement. Dan File will be there to give us another lesson. 715 and room 109. Is there any further announcements or reductions? Seeing none. Majority Leader Eskar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the House stand in recess until later today. Seeing no objection, the House will stand in recess until later today. <laughs>